Hello everyone, this is Criminal Profiler Pat Brown, and today we've got the Julie Ray case. Um, and that's because Benny, one of my wonderful patrons from Patreon, bugged me like many times and also sent me $1,000 to do the show. <laughs> no, don't I wish Benny. <laughs> That didn't happen. But he did really say, hey, can you please do this one about Julie Ray? Because I think it's such an interesting case. So, oh, thank you. I have clear picture and sound. Cross your fingers because it has been a nightmare getting to this show today. Um, you know, in the night, the computer decided they were going to, you know, um, up, you know, set the update. You know how they update. I came here today and I couldn't even figure out how to turn the computer off and on because of the updates. I can't find any of the normal settings. They're all completely in new places and whoever put it together is a sadist because really the other one worked it was very simple and basic and now it's like so stupid. So you know how they make things better? <clears throat> no, they didn't. So I'm glad you can see and hear me and I hope I'm not purple or pink like I was the other day. <laughs> So anyway, but oh, okay, so I'm hot already and look this I put this on because I was gonna wear this red color and see what happens when I take this off now, now you see you see this little weird little brown line around me Yeah, that's I try to fix that like you wouldn't believe because that's the green screen issue and you have to change all kinds of settings And but I'm hot so get used to it little little line around me <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. Oh my goodness. There are so many great people here today. Lisa, Gretchen, uh, Carrie, Martin, Benny, of course, um, is here. Annie is here. Uh, let's see who else is here. The two Lisas are here. Red Rum is here. Martin's here. Let see who I miss here. Um, <laughs> Molly's here. Fantastic. Oh. oh, my favorite people are here. And if I missed your name, I feel really bad right now. Okay. Uh, but if you're watching this now and you're saying, which many people do. Why didn't I get the notification from YouTube for this live show? I wanted to participate. All the lives are for patron only people. If you go below, you'll see a link to Patreon. You can join there. Um, I, I decided to make the live part patron only because this keeps me having really great people who are interested in learning about profiling and not a whole bunch of weirdos coming in causing trouble. So that's why I did it. And also you can support the channel that way. So, oh, I might as well show you the, uh, the usual, uh, what, 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 hold on a second, guys, I lost my mind. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, so yes, you can join Patreon and select a membership level for what you'd like to do, especially if you want to join all the lives. Also, you can just subscribe to the channel. You just don't want to do that. You don't, you're broke. <laughs> Get it? Um, just subscribe to the channel and help the uh, algorithm. And you can always buy a cool book. $2.99 at Amazon. That's my fiction story. It's fun. Okay, that's my spiel, and I want to get on to this case. Okay, now let me get rid of this picture. Okay, let me get on to the case of Lisa Ray and what happened to her. Now, I'm going to do this a little in an interesting and a little bit different way, okay? So I want to point this out to you to begin with. First, uh, I'm going to give you the whole the, the story in a, a shortened form because I don't like long stories and I don't tell long stories well. Um, uh, this is going to be a short version of what exactly what happened over the years. Uh, and it is going to be the media version because this is what this case, this is absolutely fascinating about this case. So Benny, thank you very much for introducing the case to me um, because it is astonishing what I learned. Uh, so I'm going to give you the media version. And this is the version that almost everybody will know. This is a version that is told uh, by the, the uh, newspapers back in the day. Um, this is the, uh, sh uh, the version which is told by 2020 and the Innocence Project. And, you know, by the time you do all that, you have one point of view. And I just want to point out to you that things are not always what they seem. So, uh, it, but it is very, very fascinating. And I had to do a bunch of research going back and forth to figure out what I thought the evidence was, what I believed. And I'm not going to tell you where that is yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the beginning. I'm going to go through what happened to uh, Julie Ray and what happened to her son. And, and then I'm going to, when I get to the point where... The kind of come to the end as, as one of the articles actually says the end I'm then going to start at the end and go back to the beginning so here is basically what happened especially if you don't know anything about this I want to point out 
most interesting thing I put originally was Julie Ray Wikipedia, because you know, I like the short version sometimes myself. Do you know there is no Julie Ray Wikipedia? And when you go to Julie Ray, Julie Ray Wikipedia, you get the Innocence Project, which is interesting because I've always said the Innocence Project controls a lot of the media. So be aware of that. All right, so let me tell you the basic story and keep keep your mind on what happens. And then I'm going to say, go all the way to the end and then I'm going to backtrack. Okay, this is Julie Ray. Hi, Doreen. Doreen's just come in. Christine is coming. Hi, guys. Um, this is Julie Ray, and this is her husband, and this is her little son. Okay, so, and this is Joel. Now, these, 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 this was a happily married couple, well, at least for a while, you know, how things go. And um, they ended up getting divorced. And Julie was in a separate home from her husband, and he got remarried. And somewhere there was a court custody battle, and he won. And I'll tell you why he won, and I'm not saying it's fair. So, you know, I, you know, Julie was obviously upset about this, and I get it, because I had a family member who went through the same thing. When a woman has a male child, and it's not a baby, so it's not nursing, it doesn't have to be next to mommy, uh, it's now 10 years, you know, 8, 9, 10 years old. Uh, Joel was killed when he was 10 years old. Um, then what happens is the judge looks at the case and says, okay, we got mommy living alone with her son and maybe she has some weirdo boyfriends, but daddy has a nice house. He got remarried to a nice woman and, and one of my relatives went through this and what happened was when they got divorced, she ended up, she had an apartment uh, and her ex had the house. He got the, the, the wife, he got the swimming pool and he got the damn dog, you know, <laughs> and, and she had sons. So the, the judge is looking at this case going, where would it, the children be best off? Well, they're saying, well, you know, with a, with a nice family household with the swimming pool, the dog and the, the couple, because women, wives aren't considered so dangerous as women who have boyfriends or new husbands. And there is a truth to that. So I get why they're coming there. So he now has the nice new wife and the home and all that. And she is struggling along, you know, and they decided to award physical custody to him. Not going to say what's right or what's wrong. I don't know all the history. I don't know how she came off in court, but I'm going to tell you, generally speaking, you know, it does happen if you, especially if you have a male offspring and the boy can be with daddy, it's, you know, and, and there's a mommy in the home. And of course, is she going to be pissed off? You betcha. Um, I would be. I'd be really upset about that too. Um, so I don't say there's anything wrong with her being upset. She's losing her son to the perfect home, you know, and um, so she has a right to be upset. So I'm going to start with that. She has that right. Okay, so now what exactly happened? So anyway, she had lost custody in, uh, two weeks prior to this crime occurring. All right, so now <clears throat> what exactly happened? All right, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to bring you through just, just sort of some general pictures uh, to illustrate. I want, to, want you to see. By this time, uh, Joel was 10 years old. Uh, so, he, you know, he was, uh, you know, out, a young man. A little young man in elementary school and all that. Um, and he was home with his mommy. And um, she had some friends over that night that things all went bad. So um, Julie and, had, and, and Joel were having, you know, another, another mother was over with her kid or kids, I can't remember. But anyway, they had a lovely night. And then the friend went home. And the friend even said, hey, Jul you know, Julie said, hey, you want to stay the night? And the friend said, no, I've got things to do. So the friend left. And then in the, in the, in the morning hours, okay, let me try to read to you how this worked. So let's go to when, when did this, so this happened on October 13th, 1997. So this is quite an old case, but it's an absolutely fascinating case. Okay, so in the early morning hours of October 13th, 1997, and these dates are important. So I'm going to go back over why they're important. Julie Ray, and by the way, her name is R-E-A, and so it looks like Rhea, but it's not. It's Julie Ray. Okay, confused me too. So Julie Ray um, was sleeping in her home when she was awakened by a scream. Concerned about her son, she went to, her son Joel, she went to investigate and yelled his name. Now, this is his room. 
So this, this, this story goes on, ABC News. But his bed was empty. Julie said she then struggled with a masked intruder um, uh, that jumped at her. And uh, in the 2020, there's going to be a 2020 show. There's two 2020 shows. The first 2020 show, she explains that this guy just appeared out of nowhere and jumped at her. Okay. Um, theoretically, in, um, let me see if I can pull this up. This is Joel's room. And, and this is like where she would have come in and, and supposedly, um, it's a little confusing here, but I'm just going to just basically say it. So she, she, the guy ju jumps at her okay and um she struggles with the masked intruder chasing him through the house bursting through two glass doors into the backyard all right um is also stated and she has stated herself she she grabbed at him and tried to hold on to him as he they were going down this hallway and she was holding on to him and she was fighting with him and she was grabbing him and she was attack you know holding on to his leg she had fallen to the floor and was holding on to his leg and he dragged her when she was holding onto his leg and then he ran out the back into the back okay wait a minute oh this is what happened 1997 october 13th that's the front of the house okay um i have a back of the house here someplace let me find it um so i've got lots and lots of photos um so let me see what i've missed here okay by the way this is this is this is julie ray with her son before all this stuff happened this is her husband. Uh, this was Len Kirk Kirkpatrick, her, Joel's father, who is no longer, you know, they were no longer married. And again, this is their bedroom. Um, and uh, so, and then she says she ended up in this backyard, still fighting with him. Um, and then he, and then he, uh, let's see what she says here. I was screaming for help. I fell to the ground and the person was behind me, hitting the back of my head and hitting my face into the ground. Then she said the intruder walked away, removing a mask under a street light before vanishing into the night. Okay. Um, and she does say she saw him. Um, and there's a couple of different stories on that, but she, there's a, there is a, there is a, uh, this is what she said he looked like. She said, sometimes she said he took off her, that he took off his mask and then looked at her and then she saw, but then she says, this is the side view of him that she saw. Okay, so anyway, this is a side view of him that she saw. So I'll get back to that later. All right, so so both Julie, uh, so uh, within minutes, she, she ran to the neighbor's house to get help. Within, within minutes, police arrived. She had a bruise over her eye, and she did indeed. Uh, let me show you the bruise over her eye. That's a bruise over her eye. She had a gash on her arm. Uh, the police immediately searched the house. They found Joel dead. His T-shirt bloody from multiple stab wounds to the chest. And by the way, they found him. Um, they found him. Sorry, behind the bed, behind the bed. Because you can see the bed's a little pulled away from the wall, so he's behind the bed. Okay. And if you go, we go back and look at the actual uh, photo here um, of this room. This is a recreation by 2020. Um, so anyway, you can see there's a space. The, the, the bed is not up against the wall, so he was found behind the bed. All right. Both Julie and her ex-husband, Len Kirkpatrick, were questioned by the police. After a bitter divorce, they had held joint custody of Joel, although Kirk remarried and working as a police officer, and this becomes an issue whether, you know, he had some pull because he was a police officer. Um, uh, he, uh, and they had, their, they had their son most of the time. Police quickly ruled out Kirkpatrick as a suspect as because he was nowhere near the scene of that, that night. So he definitely has an alibi. The dad did not do this. Um, on the other hand, uh, Julie, Julie Ray uh, was at the time commuting to school to finish her doctorate in psychology, and she primarily saw Joel on weekends. Although she had no criminal record, Kirkpatrick suspected his wife from the very beginning. I think it was simply a matter of, if you can't have Joel, neither can I. All right. However, there was no hard evidence directly linking anyone to the crime. Frustrated by a number of dead-end leads and, a little, and little physical evidence, the case came to a standstill. Local authorities continued to press Ray on the detail of her story, and Special State Prosecutor Ed Parkinson, is the name Parkinson? Yeah, Parkinson, and that, this is this guy here. Um, so I'm going to find the dude. Where's Parkinson? Mm -mm -mm -mm. 
I've got so many people here now. Is that is that Parkinson or am I the wrong? Ah, there he is. Okay. Oops, come back. Come back. Okay. This is this was the guy. This is pro, the pro, one who prosecuted the first case. She was tried twice at Parkinson, the special prosecutor, state of Illinois. All right. He believed there was a solid case against Ray, and he quickly pressed for an indictment. Um, and then he said this: To believe her, you would have to believe that an assailant came into her home in the middle of the night in dark clothes hiding his identity by the use of a mask for the sole purpose of killing a 10 year old boy. And after he accomplished his result, he pulled off the mask to identify himself to her. Nonsense. Also, one of the big problems was he claimed that um, the guy had entered the home without a weapon and used a weapon from the home. And there was a weapon that was, the weapon that was used was from the, uh, that butcher block. One of the knives on the butcher block was used. And another thing that they claimed was that they found the knife in the hallway and the knife was lying there without spatter around it. So it looked like it had been placed as opposed to being like dropped or thrown. All right. So in October of 2000, she was indicted for the murder of her son, Joel. A year and a half later, the case went to trial. She steadfastly maintained her in innocence throughout. I did not commit this crime, she told 2020 when we first reported in her, on her case in 2002. So that's important. So she, she gets um, convicted, but in 2002, um, that's when the case went to trial. She said, I could not, I'm not capable, I would not. And she also said a very interesting thing. She said, Joel knows I didn't commit this crime. Um, armed with only circumstantial evidence, the prosecution put Ray Harper's character on trial. Witness after witness questioned her behavior and her demeanor at the scene and in the courtroom. Her former husband, Kirk Patrick, portrayed her as a vol volatile and unstable woman. And they pushed the concept that she had, when she got pregnant, she wanted an abortion because she wanted to you know, go on with her life. And so that was like supposedly something that very much influenced the jury. Okay, so despite these direct attacks, Ray Harper's lawyer, by the way, the reason it says Harper is because she remarried. Uh, she's no longer married to that guy, but she was remarried to him. She married him later. Uh, made the controversial decision not to have her testify, worried that her ability to stand up to the prosecutor would just not do well. Not hearing from Ray Harper seemed to seal her fate. One juror said, I needed to hear her tell her story. I looked, her, looked at her for two weeks, stared into her eyes for two weeks, and wanted her to tell the story. The jury only needed five hours to find Ray Harper guilty of first degree murder, and she was sentenced to 65 years in prison. All right, so this is the first trial. Now, what happened was right after she got convicted, 2020 did a story on her case. All right, now, the story goes like this, and there, there's a couple of versions of this story, so it's very hard to get to the truth, depending on who's telling the story about who, who came up with, you know, Tom, Tommy Lynn Sells as, as a possible actual killer, you know, because everybody wants to take credit for it. Hey, I'm the one who figured it out. Okay, so this is what happened next. All right, so we have the 2020 show came out and uh, an author by the name of, uh, okay, Diane Fanning. And, and and I've known Diane for years. Um, Diane and I, we, we worked on a, I had a blog called Women in, Women in Crime, Inc. I think that's the name of our blog. We had a lot of good stuff, and, and and Diane was a contributor to that. And we also had some some interesting experiences along the way. So she's a lovely person, lovely person. Okay, so what happened was she was supposedly watching this. Well, she was not supposedly. She was watching this 2020 show that came out right after the trial, and she was watching it. And and one of the things that really bugged her was that. The prosecutor said that, you know, this whole story is ridiculous that she told um, because the prosecutor said there was no sign of an intruder. And let me show you what, remember the, remember the, remember the, the, the knife that didn't look, look like it had been laid down. He also said that, hey, look, you know, um, this is the hallway in which there was supposedly a struggle going on and all the pictures are perfect. There's no, and, and that butcher block that the, that the, um, the butcher block that the, the knife was taken off of, it was dark. He says, so this guy comes to the crime scene, doesn't even bother to bring a weapon with him. 
you know, who comes to a crime scene to kill somebody without a weapon? And he said, and then he goes into the kitchen, and it's pretty dark in the kitchen. He doesn't turn a light on. He's in the car, and there's, he manages to grab a knife without disturbing anything, so that's ridiculous. Then he goes and stabs up this boy, and then somehow um, he has a fight with, with the, the mother in the hallway. Uh, she's, she's, she's hanging on to him, and she's grabbing his leg, and she, he's pulling her down the hallway and he, all that. He's trying to get out. She's trying to stop him, and there's nothing disturbed in the hallway at all. Then, they, then there's this back door issue, um, and the back door issue is that supposedly during the, when they were trying, he was trying to escape from her. Um, his elbow went through the door and caused it to the, the, the um, glass to smash. And the claim is that the the glass was in the wrong place. If this happened the way she described it, but it looked more like the way it really happened was it was staged. So that's what he's saying. So he's saying that this was this is garbage that um she this was a staged crime scene but what what attracted diane fanning to the case was that when he said no one would go into a house without bringing a weapon to kill somebody and she's like you gotta be kidding me tommy lee tommy lynn sells hey i'm writing a book about this dude he's done that more than once and i can honestly support diane fanning in this because I have, there are other serial killers who have done the same thing. Danny Rowling, one of the biggest serial killers of all time, definitely did that. Sometimes just, just didn't have a bother to have a weapon with him. And guess what you know is in a kitchen? Knives. <laughs> and most people, you know, butcher blocks are really popular. So a lot of people have butcher blocks right on their counter. And, you know, you can go in there and select a, a knife. You don't have to bother to bring it. You don't have to bother to take it away. Um, Useful stuff, and you know it's in the kitchen. You know that. Um, now, can you get into a kitchen and grab it and not disturb anything? Can there be a fight in a hallway? There's nothing disturbed. Can that happen? Is another question. But she was particularly taken by the fact that the prosecutor said, who would do that? That doesn't happen. Well, I, I agree with her. The prosecutor was wrong in saying that. It does happen. So she she had been writing to Tommy Lynn Sells in prison, writing this book about all his other creepy crimes. And so... Uh, she asked him specifically, hey, she, she said, I saw this show. She didn't say what show. And she didn't say where the crime happened. She said, I saw this show, and the, the prosecutor said, this guy's an idiot. He said that nobody would come without a knife, blah, blah, blah. And so what happened was, he, she said, what do you think? And he wrote back to her, was that, the, was that, the, was that like maybe two days after? before my Springfield, Missouri murder. So in other words, if you look here on the, on the 13th is when, uh, when uh, Joel Kirkpatrick was killed. And on the 15th of October is when uh, Tommy Lynn Sells killed a girl in, uh, in Springfield, Missouri. Now he's asking, is it two days before I committed the 15th, the October 15th crime? And she's like, holy crap, how do you know this stuff? And so, you know, she's like, geez. And so she's like, oh, my God, this, 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 I think Tommy Lynn Sells killed, you know, Joel and not his mother, you know. So, so what happened was after that came out, now the story gets a little confusing here as to who's telling the story about how uh, Tommy Lynn Sells became this great suspect. Was it, was it Diane that started it, or was it the Innocence Project people? And if you go to the Innocence Project site, they're going to say it was them. <laughs> okay, so let me, let me try to read you the part where um, it says, okay, uh, there was no murder or motive. Well, there was motive, so that's nonsense. There was motive, like you can't have them. If I can't have them, nobody can, so that's just not true. There was no motive or evidence that she had killed her only child. Julie was indicted by a special prosecutor, and she was convicted. Okay. Now, what happened? Oh, wait a minute. I want, oh, that's not the one I wanted. I'm trying to find the one that says, okay. So there was a, the, one, of the, one of the technical issues I had right before the show was I had everything open to the right place, and my computer crashed and wiped out all my windows. <laughs> Boy, that's annoying. Okay. Um, there was uh, somebody working on the case that called the Innocence Project and said, look, we think you should look into, um, you, we think you should look into this guy named Tommy Lynn Sells. Now, this is before she saw the show. 
mind you. And so it's like, who really came up with Tommy Lynn cells? I don't know, but somebody else supposedly said you ought to look on Tommy, uh, look at Tommy Lynn cells. So, the Innocence Project started looking, and there's a guy by the name of Bill Clutter. Um, let's see if I can find Bill. This is this is Bill. Um, Bill, Bill is a, an investigator. He works for the Innocence Project, um, and he's uh, so he was informed. Uh, okay, let's see what it says here. Bill Clutter advised her attorney to investigate cells. Now, actually, the attorney supposedly called Bill Clutter, but you see, everything is like very confusing here. It doesn't really matter who came up with Tommy Lynn cells, but everybody's claiming credit. <laughs> okay, so Julie's privately retained attorney was referred to private investigator Bill Clutter. Clutter was informed that the attorney's client was facing indictment on capital murder charges. Now, this is prior to the 2020 thing, so isn't that interesting? Uh, hearing Julie's description of the assailant and the details of the crime, Clutter suggested investigating whether Tommy Lee Sells committed the crime. Now, this is before she supposedly saw it on the 2020 show. <laughs> and they leave her out, and Innocence Project completely. They just, they just get rid of uh, Diane Fanning. <laughs> this, is, this is why the media is so hard to trust. Okay, who figured out, who decided on Tommy Lee Sells? Tommy Lynn Cell, sorry. Lee is a, such a common name for serial killers as a middle name, so Lynn is not as common. Anyway, um, so anyway, uh, hearing Julie's description of the assailant and the details of the crime, Clutter suggested investigating whether Tommy Lee Lynn Sells committed the murders. The murder. The description of the intruder and the modus operandi, said Clutter, fit the description of a confessed child killer, Tommy Lynn Sells. So then they're talking about how in Texas he had, he had broken into a home and stabbed to death a 13-year-old child while the rest of the family slept. Okay, and he did do that. that that's, and so he was serving, he was up for, um, he was arrested, he was uh, got the death penalty, and he was on death row in, in Texas, okay, in Huntsville. All right, so Clutter suggested that the defense uh, investigation should look at cells as a possible suspect in the murder. Okay, I don't know what happened to poor Diane. All right, so anyway, prosecutors prevent, prevent access to reforms designed to protect innocent people. So anyway, she got charged with capital murder in 2000. She exhausted a life, uh, life savings on private counsel. She got pro se pet petition, uh, and she got these guys to, you know, um, represent her, and theoretically, they sucked. So that's why she ended up getting convicted. All right, so... But the prosecutor's decision to back away from the death penalty deprived Julie of the reforms, blah, blah, blah. Okay, all right. And it says here, uh, uh, prosecutors used emotionally charged evidence in their zeal to convict. So basically, oh my God, she wanted an abortion when she was younger, so that means she didn't want Joel, that kind of nonsense. Okay, I agree, that's, 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 that's just nonsense. All right, so anyway, the, the jury convicted her. All right, so on May 31st, okay, now they're gonna say after the, Julie was sentenced, 2020 aired her story. Diane Fanning, a crime true, a true crime author on serial killer Tommy Lynn Sells, watched the program. She corresponded with Sells. Without providing him when the crime occurred, Sells wrote back and asked if this murder happened two days before his Springfield, Missouri murder. Okay. On October 15th, two days after Joel's murder, Sells abducted and killed 13-year-old Stephanie Mahaney. He was indicted for that murder by a grand jury after he gave details that only the killer would know. So now... Bill Clutter, see, see how this kind of, it's a little confusing here. Now Bill Clutter, he's going to start investigating. Okay, so now the story goes like this. All right, there was eyewitness testimony. Now, because now he's looking at, could, could Sells have been there? Could, could he have been there? So now he's investigating. And he's come up with this guy. Um, this guy uh, is Alan Berkshire. Uh, he's a Lawrenceville resident, and he went, he went one day, a couple of days prior to the crime. Um, let me see if I can find this here. Okay, yeah, let's see. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Is it that? Yes. Three days before Joel Kirkpatrick's murder. There's his diner, and he goes to the diner, and he says this guy comes in. He's really creepy, and he starts a conversation with him, and he starts talking to his son and saying weird things to his son, like, hey, you scared of me? You should be scared of me. And then he claims that the guy left, left the diner and started going down the railroad tracks, and that the railroad tracks kind of almost led to the uh, Joel Kirk Kirkpatrick's house, right? 
This is three days before the crime. So now, supposedly, it's, now look, look at the way they say this. He saw cells. Okay, he actually didn't say he saw cells. So we're going to start now backtracking. He didn't say he saw cells. He said he saw a guy that looked like the description that was given by Julie Julie Ray went because after she was attacked, she did give she did give a um, description, and here it is. Okay, um, here he is. This is the guy. Um, she said this is the guy that attacked her. He was between fourteen and seventeen years old, between not five nine and five eleven, and thin built. Okay, so that's who she said attacked. And so this guy, um, this guy in the diner says. He, he, he looked like he didn't actually say he was cells. This is what the report from the media now says that he identified cells. He didn't. He, had, he said the guy that was in the diner three days before looked like the guy in the uh, the sketch that was given out by the police. Except for the fact this is kind of weird to me because if Julie Ray said he was 14 to 17 years old, Tommy Lynn Cells at the time was 33. You know, and I'm, 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 I'm sorry, but a dude who's sitting there with his son is going to know the difference between a 17-year-old. I'm going to give the higher number. 17-year-old years old, 17 year old and a 33-year-old. Now, one could claim that Julie Ray and, you know, all that was going on freaked out and thought the guy looked young and thought he looked like a teenager as opposed to a 33-year-old man. More possible. But the fact that this guy says this guy looks like the, the sketch, which is a 17-year-old and is a 17-year-old boy or under, he would have to say to himself, dude looks like he's in his 30s, man. <laughs> it can't be the same guy. But apparently now this guy's word is good. So now Clutter is out there saying, oh, see, he was seen three days before the murder when there's no proof of this. So this is the problem with media. No proof of this. I don't care if you think she's innocent or you think she's guilty. There's zero proof that that guy in the in the diner was was uh, Tommy Lynn Sells. Now it gets even more interesting. So that's not the only piece of evidence he comes up with. So now he talks to this lady. Mm -mm -mm, let me find her. Let me find the other lady. He finds a woman who says she's very upset because there she is. This is this is the lady. Um, she sells tickets at the Greyhound bus station, okay? So, and, and she, um, let, me, let me just pull up my bus picture. All right, where's my bus? All right, so she's selling tickets at the Greyhound bus station. And while she's there, she says that this guy came in. This was now two days after the crime. Uh, well, let's see, no, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. The night after the, the night let me get it straight. Um, the, the, the crime occurred. Let me let me pull up the other picture here. So the crime occurred on. Let's get this straight because this gets this is where it gets very interesting. Where's my where's my? Oh yeah, my I, here we go. Okay, so the crime occurred on the fifteenth. No, no, no. The crime occurred on the thirteenth. Let me get it straight. On the thirteenth, the the morning of the thirteenth. She claims the guy came in on the night of the 13th and was disheveled and weird acting and he bought this ticket, okay? And the ticket would put him on the 14th, that's the next day, in St. Louis where they change buses. Okay, uh, so the, now what's interesting about this is where did he buy the ticket? He didn't buy the ticket in the location where um, Joel Kirkpatrick was murdered in his home you see up there at the top, it says Lawrenceville. That's where he was murdered. And the woman sold the ticket in Princeton, which is, what is that? 40 minutes by the fastest route to the south. It says southeast. Now, okay, so somewhere between the time he that Sells supposedly killed the kid, he somehow went to Princeton for reasons which we have absolutely no clue of. Now, he goes to Princeton. See, now this map, you'll see that Lawrenceville is on top, Princeton is on the bottom, and St. Louis is over there to the, to the uh, west. So if you're in Lawrenceville and you want to go see your sick mother in St. Louis, which is what he supposedly was doing, why the hell are you in Princeton? I don't know what you're doing in Princeton. Haven't got a clue. Why did you go south? Why, and, you know, how did you get there? And we're going to talk about how he got to these places in a minute. Wouldn't he just go straight to St. Louis? 
so anyway, there's a very short time frame between the this this crime that was committed in Lawrenceville and the crime that was committed in um, Springfield, Missouri, which is to the west of St. Louis by another 200 miles. So the question is, if he was in Lawrenceville, no, is there proof he was in Lawrenceville? I don't believe the guy who who claims that he's a... Uh, uh, he didn't know the difference between a 17 year old and a 33 year old is, is necessarily accurate about the diner issue. And then later that night, um, this woman says, Oh my God, you know, he uh, bought this uh, ticket. And the reason I was, she says this, the reason it stood out to me was he bought a ticket to this place, Winnemucca, 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 Nevada, something we don't see very much. Okay. Now, it turns out that Tommy Lee has a connection to this place in Nevada. And two months after this crime, he was there. So you think, oh my God, this is very good information. And she, apparently she called the police and they didn't give a crap about what she had to say. So they just ignored it and went on and pro prosecuted Julie and, and, and she got convicted. So now, after all this happens, so now we have the Innocence Project and we have Diane Fanning and these two witnesses who say they saw cells or somebody like cells. Oh, by the way, one of the reasons that the, the police dis discredited this woman was because she said, again, he looked like the, the sketch. And he was 17 years old. Well, again, cells is 33. I'm sorry, there's a big difference between 17 and 33. And she should have seen the difference. If he's standing in front of her at a window buying a ticket, you would think she'd notice, no, that he's not, a, he's not a teenager, that he's an older man. And so that's why they're like, are you kidding me? So these are very sketchy, supposed um, witnesses. So, okay. But that's what they say. So anyway, she gets a new trial. Um, and in the second trial, she is, ex she is found not guilty. Um, they say it has nothing to do with Tommy Sells, even though now Tommy Sells has supposedly confessed to the crime. And I'll get to his confession in a minute. So he's confessed to the crime. He's confessed to things that nobody would know but the killer. Um, and so they don't actually use that in the trial. They use, they, they, they develop a dream team, a dream team from uh, this fellow here. Let's see if I can find him out here. Um, where is he? Where'd he go? Okay, he's gone missing. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, he went missing. Uh, here's the... He's the, yeah, fine. Anyway, he is the, you know, with the Illinois Innocence Project. Um, so he's, they put together literally a dream team. Um, and so, and here's, here's uh, Tommy Lynn confessing on CNN. I mean, I mean, uh, 2020 goes and says, hey, you know, I think it's Barbara Walters. She's like, hey, did you kill her? And kill the boy? And he says, yep. Okay. So, I mean, he looks, it's pretty interesting. He looks very possibly guilty. Um, and then there's two people who maybe cited him in these locations. And so it goes back to trial and she is, a, she is found not guilty by the second jury because they say it's because, well, they put together a dream team. I mean, the best team money could have bought, but she didn't have to pay for it. So this huge team suddenly comes in and they have so much time to, to come up with blood spatter pattern questions and all of these things that sound good to the jury. And they did sound good to the jury. And then they said, oh, but, it, you know, we didn't really put, we, we, you know, they knew about Tommy Sells and all that, but we didn't push that. But, you know, once you tell, once the jury knows about Tommy Sells and, and they also played a thing where he confessed, I mean, you know, they're, they're going to believe it. They're just going to go for it. So the jury went for it. They thought there's not any evidence that shows that she did this. Tommy Sells looks like the dude. So they found her not guilty. And then Illinois, uh, which I never knew this existed, they gave her a certificate of innocence that it was proven that she was not guilty and she couldn't and she couldn't have committed the crime. And I find that really interesting because usually the reason you would get such a thing as a certificate of innocence is because they absolutely have somebody else. But guess what? Tommy Lynn Sells was never prosecuted in this crime. It's just his confession. And so, and the belief by this jury that she didn't commit the crime, but there's no proof. So I'm not sure how they put out a certificate of innocence, but anyway, they did. So there we are. So now the question is, did Tommy Lynn Sells, who was a nasty piece of work, kill Joel Kirkpatrick on that night? I mean, after all, 
he came up with that date, you know, and Diane Fanning's like, what? You know, how did you come up with that date? How, you know, good God, I, did, I didn't give you the information. How did you come up with that date? And then after that, he comes up with some information, like she had rug burns and he, you know, he dragged her and all this kind of stuff. And how would he know that unless he did it? And, you know, all of this. Okay. So it's pretty interesting, isn't it? Uh, and what about, what about this town in Nevada? I mean, the guy bought a ticket to this town in Nevada. It's a really weird town. And he, he, he ended up there eventually. So even though the ticket, you know, the ticket lasts for a year, supposedly. And the ticket, you can't go to St. Louis, Missouri, and then go on to that spot. I mean, you can. But Springfield, where he ended up a day later, um, there's no, that's not the same ticket. So how did he end up there? All right. So... Doesn't this get confusing? Yes. All right. So now what I'm going to do, you got 51 comments here I haven't been able to say. <laughs> I'm going to stop here for a second because now I'm going to go back and look at the actual evidence. Um, <laughs> my Molly says, I'm waiting to hear Sal's confessions. You're not going to hear it from me. Um, Sal's confessions. Okay. Here's the, here's again, the problem of being on the internet and trying to get information. Boy, is it hard to get information. I'm telling you, um, you're getting what's fed to you. And uh, although I have been surprised by information people get that I didn't find. Okay, you can find. I'm going to say, if you guys spend 100 hours on this, <laughs> you might come up with something like, dang, I never saw that. I don't know how you even found it because I put in the same search engines and I didn't come up with it. Here's what happens. I came up with the, the transcript of the first trial. Do you know how I found that? Read it. I, I, I don't know. I, it's, if I put in uh, Julie Ray transcript, first trial, put the year, nothing. I put the second trial. I've never come up with a second trial transcript. I don't know where the second trial transcript is, transcript is. I have not seen the supposed confession of, of, um, of Tommy Lynn Sells. I can't find it. Now, admittedly, I'm not going to spend the you know, next 100 hours of my life doing this. I'm not. Um, but that's the problem. Why does the media not have it clearly put out there? Why is it not an easy way to find out this information? Why did I only find out the first trial information, which is really interesting, by luck through Reddit? So that's part of the problem. So, wait, are you, when I'm, are you, are you, is this the correct? When I'm mucka. When I'm mucka. How do you know that, Kay? When I'm mucka. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. Okay. Um, the <laughs> the plot thickens. Okay. Um, oh, P Benny says, I predict Pat will agree with me that Julie is guilty. Hey, I'm not even there yet. I'm not, not saying that. And then Vergarine says, I predict Pat thinks Julie is innocent. What do you all predict? Oh, I like this. <laughs> okay. Now, I'm going to say something right here. Oh, wait a minute. I've got a, I've got things open that I... Oh, okay. Sorry, Doreen. I've got to get you off there now. Okay. She has been found by the Circuit Court of Illinois. She has been given a certification certification of innocence. She has been found not guilty in the second trial. I am not going to say she's guilty or not guilty. I'm going to say what I find the evidence tends to lean toward. And there are some things which I cannot get wrap my head around, and I'm going to get to that. And that's going to be the most fascinating part of this show, so hang in. All right, so let's talk first about Tommy Lynn Sells. Let's start with him. Did he do it? Is there proof that he did it? Because Tommy Lynn Sells is a nasty piece of work. <laughs> Can he do it? You betcha. He's a vicious, uh, and he's a, he's, a, he's a drifter type. He goes from place to place to place to place. So he could have ended up in Lawrenceville for whatever freaking reasons because he's just a drifter. So could he have done it? Absolutely. Did he do it? That's the other question. Is there proof? And this is, if we're going to look at, if you're going to give people, uh, if you're going to say somebody's, Guilty. You got to have proof. Okay, so now let's go back, and I'm going to show you something that happens. Okay, so uh, Tommy Lynn Sells. Let me explain to you who he is and what he's been convicted of. This was in Wikipedia. Okay, Tommy Lynn Sells. Let me let me put his little little unfriendly face up here again, so you can see his lovely picture. Yes, he's an, I'm gonna. I'll put his original. I'll put this one up. <laughs> it looks like another character. He looks too nice in that prison interview. Like, hi, I'm your uncle. You know, um, Tommy Lynn Sells was an American serial killer. He was convicted of one murder, which he received the death penalty for and was eventually executed. 
Authorities believe he committed a total of 22 murders. Now, you'll notice that I said many times, closing cases by blaming him on a serial killer that you know is an easy way to get out of having to solve them and to have get your to get the family off your back. It's like, you know, you keep saying, you know, they, they keep bugging me, but I think he could have done it, and they just blame it on him. This does happen. Okay, so there's a bunch of cases which he's suspected of. Now, here's an interesting one. In November of 17, November 17th, 1987, he's, it says he's linked. Now, now here's again, this is the wrong word. Sells is also linked to these crimes. Now, how was he linked? He was linked because you think he might have done it? That's not linking. Linking is DNA. Linking is evidence in his house. Linking's proof. <laughs> linking is not your, your imagination. Um, or that he claims he did it without proof. So he's been linked, which is, which is incorrect. All right. Anyway, murders of four members of the Dardine family in Illinois. Now, if you go to Diane's book, all right, let's see if I can find this. Oh, let me do the earlier one. Sorry. There was another one, too. Uh, I want to do that one first. Uh, where is it? Okay, hold on a second. Um, okay, i gotta, I got to pull it up here. Um, untangling a murder mystery. No, that's not it. Uh, hold on a second. Heartland. This is it. Nope, that's not it. Hold on a second. Oh, yeah, Ina and Rory Court. All right. This is this is a this is a case. It says here, it's been thirty five. This is Forsyth, Missouri. It's been forty five years, uh, thirty five years since the killing of Anna and Rory Court. Anna's the mother. Rory was a boy. Um, the man who allegedly killed the mother allegedly now they got that right here, killed the mother and son was serial killer Tommy Lynn Sells. Sells was known as the Coast to Coast Killer. All right. So supposedly now. Taney County Detective Don Swan got Sells to admit, once got Sells to admit, he murdered the two. Dirks doesn't believe he killed Sells. That's her daughter. She says, for several years, I did believe he did it, that the case was solved. But then it was brought to my attention that the police did not believe that and that they believed Don went to the jail where Tommy Lynn Sells was and showed him a photo at mom's house and basically helped to feed him information that Tommy Lynn Sells would just agree with. He didn't actually come up with any information on his own. See what happens? Okay, now when we go to Diane's book, and I hope I can find this here. Give me a, give me a sec here. Oh yeah, here it is, okay. Chapter eight. Now, I have a, a, an objection to what Diane does here, and a lot of people do this, and it really pisses me off. Um, not at the person themselves, but at the methodology used. All right, it says here, the yard of split-level home on Willow Lane was littered with balls and toys and other signs of a child. Inside, the rooms were clean but slightly disheveled. It was late when Tommy arrived. And little Willie, that was the name of the boy, they, they, his nickname, was in bed. Okay, so according to Tommy, it was a pleasant visit, and he went to the house, blah, blah, blah. Uh, when he emerged from the bathroom, he caught Ina, or Anna, her pink negligee clad body bent over his bag. Without a moment's doubt, he concluded that she was after his stash of cocaine. Of course, now, first of all, if a serial killer tells you this is what happened, he's blaming the victim, probably wasn't that way at all. It's bull crap. That's why he has to kill somebody, because she was snooping. That's used so often. It was her fault. She shouldn't have messed with my stuff. She was trying to steal my money. She was whatever. Convinced she was trying to steal his drugs, he flew into a rage. No one steals from Tommy Lynn Sells. No one treats him like a punk. He roared down the hallway, spotted little Willie's baseball bat along the way, and snatched it up without slowing his pace in his race toward Anna, or Ina. He, she froze in the icy glare of his cold eyes. He lifted the bat high in the air and slammed it down with fury. Viciously, he beat her on the head, her upraised arms on her bow, bowed back. She screamed. She begged for help. She prayed for her neighbors to hear. That makes, I'm right, I have a problem right there. I do not think it is appropriate to claim what victims have said and done when there's no way you could know. You're fictionalizing something and it shouldn't be fictionalized. The family has no reason to want to have to think this is what their child went through because it's not even, it's not even true and we don't know that it's true. So it's a nonsense. Even if the serial killer says, oh, then she screamed, he may be lying. So all you want to do is tell the crime scene. You don't want to go through this. But I'm going through this just because I want you to see how this is manipulated in media. Um, so anyway, he uh, kills her. I'm not going to go further on that. Um, 
and he gets a knife and then he does that. Okay, Cells noticed Willie too. He stepped over to the battered, lifeless body of Ina. And in two strides, his hands grasped the scrawny little, scrawny little arm of the four-year-old boy and dragged him to the living room. And then he beat him with a baseball bat until he was dead because he was told once that he should never leave a witness alive. Okay, I'm bringing this case up for another reason too about who he kills. And supposedly, if he committed this crime, he killed the boy because he was a witness to what happened to his mother, not because the boy was the target. Now, now as you see, Diane... Diane has written this story as if it is true, and there is zero evidence that Tommy Sells committed this crime. Yet, when you read this book, oh look, Tommy Sells did it. You have no clue that he did it. Now, it goes on to, um, to another crime. Uh, it is the, the Dardine crime, and I definitely won't read that to you because I found that incredibly, horrifically, horrifically gory. Um, and, and one of the worst crimes I've ever, ever read in my life. But it says, um, let me see, let's see, where are we? Are. It's, there's so many crimes in here, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to figure out where it is. Okay, so anyway, th this is a case where she writes in the book, Tommy Lynn Sells goes to this house and he kills the mother, the child, and she apparently goes into labor while the crime is going on and he kills the baby that emerges from the body and then he also takes the father to a field and and kills him and then cuts his private parts off and it says the whole thing tommy lynn sells tommy sell tommy did this and tommy did that and tommy did this and tommy did that now let's go to the dardine crime uh as i says is this it i oh, no, wrong one again okay where is it where is it where is it where is it uh i hear it is okay this was put out about the Dardines. Okay, now what does it say about the Dardines and who killed the Dardines? Let me find it here. All right, let's go, let's go, let's go. Sorry. All right. A few years later, Kemp, that's the investigator, would interview Tommy Lynn Sells, who claimed responsibility for the Dardine murders. And he, came, he changed his story a number of times. So, and then he was executed. Now, uh, so she, this one, the, uh, I think this is the um, uh, jo Joanne uh, Dardine uh, has been a constant voice in the, uh, to, the, to the public and to law enforcement since her son Keith and his young family were murdered. And she's still trying to figure out who did this, but she does not believe it was Tommy Lynn Sells because he changed his story and you know, there's no proof that he was there. So again, in the book that Diane Fanning wrote, it looks like he's the guilty guy. Now, it goes on. Now, if you go on in, in, in her book, so now you get to the case of Joel, uh, hold on a second, uh, Joel Kirkpatrick. Now, uh, don't do that to me. All right, so, okay, I gotta find it here. Hold on a second. All right, um, so now he's, uh, Okay. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, where are we here? Hold on a second. One more second here. So anyway, he was in Missouri. And he... Okay, I gotta, I gotta go to my other section to see if I can... Okay, I've got it in pink here. All right, so it says, so he apparently leaves, um, okay, Tommy Lynn Sells leaves his, he has a wife at this point, and he leaves West Virginia, and he, he goes to St. Louis um, in September. He's in St. Louis, remember? Well, now, let me put the picture up of the, the location again, because this is, this is uh, quite important. So now he's in, he's in St. Louis. All right. That's the wrong one. All right, there he is on the left side of the thing. You see St. Louis. He's in St. Louis on September 5th. Uh, oh, no, no, he called us. On September 5th, he called her. And then he goes back to West Virginia, and he gets Nora from the Mountain State, takes her to his mother's home. By this time, she's pregnant. Um, in October, he gets a mechanic's job. He stays off of drugs for three weeks. Family had high hopes he's going to settle down, but they couldn't keep him off the drugs. So anyway, 
everything goes to hell. By mid-October, he was stalking fresh prey. And now you come to this problem again. So now he's, he's in St. Louis, and it's not that far from, from this Lawrence, the, the place where Joel Kirkpatrick lives, right? In Lawrenceville. Sells privately admitted to the murder of Joel Kirkpatrick. That's for, to her at that point in time. He had never confessed to authorities, and no one has undertaken an investigation. Well, they did later. Um, so now, now it says here, the following is a combination of the facts of the crime and the details provided by Tommy Lynn Sell. So now she's merged them as if his confession was real. And he's, she's merged them in such a way that you can't tell what he said and what she's adding in as proof that he did it. Sells traveled east of St. Louis on Interstate 64. How does she know that? Well, okay, an exit onto Route 50 sent him straight across Illinois to Lawrenceville near the Indiana border. What is he traveling in? Can anybody tell me that right now? I'm going to stop here. So now Tommy Lynn Sells is left. What is she saying? He said he left St. Louis. How is he getting to Lawrenceville? Can anybody tell me? I'm going to get down to the bottom here. Okay. <laughs> that, <laughs> uh, yeah, I probably won't get a Christmas card from Diane. I do love you, Diane. I, and you write really well. I just really find this problematic. Bus. Really? He took an, okay, he traveled east on Interstate 64. An exit sent him straight across Illinois to Lawrenceville near the Indiana border. An exit sent him. Okay, hitchhiking, maybe. Or what, what are the possibilities? He could be hitchhiking, but it was an exit that sent him. Why would an exit send you someplace? I have a problem with the word exit sending you. Now, I'm not saying this is any of this is valid. I'm just saying, as this book is written, and I'm going to get to you why this is so important later. So he's he's traveling on Route 50. No, I'm sorry, I'm traveling straight across on Interstate 64, and an exit takes him to Route 50. Now, she doesn't say how he's getting there, but it's indicating, in my opinion, that he's in a vehicle. He's in a car because the exit's taking him. So, you know, you're driving along, going, oh, I'll take this exit. That's what it seems like. He's in a car. And I'll explain this to you later. All right. So Sells first met Julie Ray at a convenience store where he said she treated him rudely. Now, here we go. Blame the victim again, right? From that moment on, Sells was consumed with a desire for revenge. Really? Okay. Anger drove him, fed him, led him straight to the front door. How the hell did he know where she lived? <laughs> Would somebody like to tell me this? How does he know a woman in a convenience store lives? If he doesn't have a car, how could he follow her to her house and know where she lives? If he's hitchhiking, if he's on a bus, he can't follow her, can he? So he has to be in a vehicle. Okay, now, supposedly then, then she goes on with the story, how he slide, he breaks into the wind, through the window, which there's no proof of anybody breaking into the house, by the way. Absolutely not. She later says that she doesn't know she accidentally let somebody in like left a door open or even invited him in. This would be true. If, if, if this story has any validity, Lisa, correct, stalking her than a car. He would have to have the car. I'm not saying the story is true. I'm just saying this is the story being told, all mixed up with supposed facts and whatever crap he's coming up with because Sells is a lying dog most of the time. All right, and a vicious guy too. So anyway, there's no proof anybody broke into the house. So later on, Julie says in some weird flashback that maybe she let the guy into the house and he gave her some date rape drugs. So <laughs> there's some weird thing later on that. But okay, anyway, he slides, he slid toward the kitchen. Such a wonderful place for a predator, always a weapon in easy reach. He picked up a knife and weighed its balance in his hand. He headed straight for the first bedroom door and there 10 year old Joel Kirkpatrick dreamed his last dream. Cells plunged the knife into Joel's body, oblivious to the blood that splattered on his face and on his clothes. A scream pierced the quiet of Julie Ray's home. It slapped her awake and lifted her out of bed. Now, interesting here, right here. It goes to the first, it kills the boy out of revenge for she's rude in the store. Now, mind you, he's never targeted boys before. Maybe as a witness, he'd kill a kid. I'm not saying he wouldn't. But he's always targeted young teen girls. That's his thing. He, he, he's a rapist and a, and a serial killer. He likes raping and murdering teen girls with a knife and slashing their throats. And this, all of a sudden, he's going in there out of revenge because she's like rude to him in a convenience store and stabs her son to death. Okay. 
again, which again, what's bothering me is that there's no proof he did this at this point, yet she's put him into the story as if he did. This to me is unethical. It's um, untruthful because we don't know that he did it. Even if he did, unless you've proven it, his name should not be put into the story. Okay? So, well, that's a good question. Well, if she was rude, why didn't he stab her? Well, see, you have when you're trying to build a story to fit the evidence, <laughs> Um, you have to have a reason that he killed the kids. So it's basically to get back at her, he's going to kill her child to make her unhappy. Now, the other thing he doesn't know, unless, unless he had a car and was stalking her, how would he know there wasn't a man in that house? How would he know, you know that there's no other people going to shoot him? How does he know anything? So anyway, um, oh, I don't know that I'm brilliant, Benny, but thank you. Pure gold, your logic about the car and how did Tommy know where she lived? And she was the target, but he killed her son instead. Thank you. Thank you for the nice words. <laughs> Might be exaggerated. Anyway, um, anyway, let's go on further. The killer left his victim lying at the foot of the bed and slipped from the boy's room and away from the approaching woman. She raced up the hall to her son. Joel, Joel. She never said any of this stuff, by the way. She never said she called out to him. Um, she never, and she looked through the doorway of the dark room and saw an empty bed. That was never in the original statements, ever. She approached his room, was what her original statement said, and the guy, like, leaped at her. And there was no light in the room. There was only a light from the hallway. She may have been able to see the bed, but, you know, at that moment with the guy jumping at you, I'm not sure how clear all that would be. She turned from the room, frantic. That is where she spotted him. The hood of his sweatshirt was pulled up, and the drawstring tightened across his face, concealing his features. She ran toward him. Her personal safety irrelevant in the fear of face of her fear for her son. She grappled with him briefly until he pushed her off and headed back toward the back of the house. Now this, by the way, is not the, that is not what she said and is not what he even confessed to. So I don't know where she got this stuff. She, this stuff isn't even accurate. She chased him through the glass doors into the backyard, screaming inarticulate pleas for help. All right. Then eventually she jumps to her feet, torn between chasing him. Now she's chasing after him in the backyard. This is true. Uh, and she trips over something supposedly and falls on her face and the intruder doubles back, hitting her in the head, hoping to delay her pursuit. She was too dazed to move or even think for a brief moment. Then she raised herself on her arms and saw the fleeing man again. He pulled the hood down, revealing his face under a streetlight. Pulled the hood down. So he had a mask, suppose he pulled it off, but hey, there we go. I'm not sure which way. And he, one time he looks her in the eyes and says, ha, huh? and the other time he just does this. Um, she jumped to her feet, torn between chasing after him and running for help. She chose the ladder and rushed to Lisa Bridget's house on the other side of the street and pounded on the door. Once inside, she called the police and reported her son's abduction. In minutes, officers were on the scene. They found 10-year-old Joel Karpatik in his bedroom. His small body was crumpled like a discarded tissue used to staunch a bloody nose. He was clothed in a blood-drenched t-shirt. The shirt was marred by a multitude of angry stab wounds. Her mother, Julie, was taken to the emergency room with a black eye, scratches and abrasions on the tops of her feet, her knees and inside her legs, wounds on both shoulders, internal bruising and a laceration on her right arm requiring five sutures. All right. Now, let's go back to, all right, this is her story. And again, she, should, she shouldn't have put him in there as, as the guy when she didn't know he was a guy. Or in the other two stories, when he wasn't proven to be the guy. He's a creepy serial killer. He's killed a lot of people. But we just, you know, putting, to say this is what happened and I suspect him is one thing. To put his name in there when there's no proof is another thing. So anyway, she has now told this, this story in here. And the Innocence Project's all over this. Now let's get back to, I will get to the, I will get to the injuries um, in, a, in a second. I'm going to get to the crime scene in just a bit. Um, I want to go back to the, the, the issue of how he got where he's going. All right. Listen to what comes next in her book. Tommy Lynn Sells was on the move headed for Springfield, Missouri. Listen, you tell me what you hear here. As he hunt, haunted its streets, a young brown-haired woman captured his attention. He followed her, watching and waiting, waiting for the moment he could lure her from her safe world and into his. Unfruitful stalking drove cells to a fever pitch. From his vantage point in his parked van, 
he sought a more vulnerable t target. Anyway, it goes on and on and on here, and he he ends up uh, at 11 o'clock. Well, he's stalking. Okay, he's stalking in Springfield, Missouri, and and so apparently. He liked this woman and it didn't work out. Then he saw a man with three children, but the oldest child was 13. So he thought that could be good. And the mother was not at home. She was in the hospital. So apparently he stalked this person to the house. At 11 o'clock, Sell saw the man leave by the back door. And then he crept in there and he grabbed the girl. Um, and he, he took her and he uh, grabbed hold of her, jerked her to the front door, tossed her into the front seat of the van. And then he drove her away and he um, eventually murdered her and dumped her in a, in a lake. And at that, I believe that, tr I believe that is a true story. Now, okay, let's go back to the picture. Let's go back to the picture. All right, now let's go back to the picture. All right, this one. All right, so he's in Lawrenceville. According to the story that Diane Fanning is telling, he went to Lawrenceville in a vehicle where he stalked uh, Julie Ray from the convenience store to her home. He killed the son. And then he goes back to St. Louis where his mother is and on to Springfield, which is a couple hundred miles further. Now, Interestingly, her story is a lot more rational than the diner story and the bus ticket story because the diner story had the guy being a drifter who wanders out of the diner and goes down the tra railroad tracks. A, if he was doing that, he didn't have a vehicle. And B, he couldn't have found, he would have found her house by accident, which is possible. But he certainly wouldn't have had a vehicle and was stalking her. He just would have picked her house for the sake of picking any old house. Uh, secondly, why would, if a guy, if he killed this kid on the third, let's say, let's see if I got to state, the 13th, the morning of the 13th, and he ends, goes to Princeton for no good reason to the south, um, and buys a ticket and can't leave till 4.30 the, 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 fo the following day. So then on the 14th, let's go back to the picture of the timeline. Let's find the, this, this picture here so we can have that behind me. Where is it? Where is, well, my timeline isn't behind me. I thought I put it there. Okay. Where's my timeline? Okay. Okay. So now it's the, okay, let's go here. All right. So on the 13th, he kills a kid. And then later that afternoon at 430, I mean, he's able to take a, a, a vehicle. I mean, uh, sorry, a bus. I believe he arrives on, let's see, how does this work? He arrives. No, wait a minute. She comes at night. He comes at night to buy the ticket. So he leaves. So he arrives in St. Louis on Tuesday on the 14th at 4.30 p.m. Uh, yeah. Is that, that 4.30 p.m.? I'm trying. Wait a minute. <laughs> Hold on a second. I'm totally confused here. Was it two days later? Oh, man. Now I'm, now I'm blanking here. Hold on a second. I've got to find the information here. I've lost my mind. Okay. Um, apparently what the point being is that he arrives in St. Louis on 4.30 on the 15th. Yeah, that's the day he kills the girl in Springfield. So if he takes a bus to St. Louis and he arrives at the day he's going to kill the girl in Springfield, he arrives at 4.30, he's supposed to be visiting his sick mother. Then he's got to get another bus to Springfield and be there to stalk people and kill, abduct her by 11 p.m. And since it's by four hours away, that's, that's pretty small time frame. Oh, no, wait a minute. He's got a van. He took the girl in a van because she ended up in a location which he couldn't have gotten there on a bus. So he had to have a van. So if he had a van, then where'd he get the van? Did he, did he take a bus back to St. Louis and pick up a van in St. Louis? No. From his mother's house? I mean, no. This is, whole thing is silly. If he killed Joel Kirk, Kirkpatrick, he had the van all the time. He never was seen in the restaurant. He was never seen at the bus station. All that's nonsense. And besides which, they said he looked 17 years old, and he's 33. So the, the garbage that Bill Clutter came up with that says he was seen in two places is nonsense. He wasn't. Could he have driven the van to Lawrenceville 
and for whatever reason picked that house or stalked her and killed her son and then driven back said hello to mummy and gone on to Springfield yes he could so Diane Fanning's story actually is more realistic than the Innocence Project so the innocent so the point is he wasn't seen any place that's just nonsense so they came up with uh, phony stories to support that he was there that people saw Tommy Lynn cells at that location um, and they did not um, so that's all garbage so we can just eliminate all that so now we come down to could Tommy Lynn cells have taken a vehicle he was already which I built with a van and gone to Lawrenceville for whatever reasons I don't know why he's going east when he wants to go west um, yeah I don't know why I'd be going there uh, but did he go there and then for some reason just target her and then come back see mommy and then go to Springfield and kill somebody else maybe okay so let's just say it's possible okay I'm gonna go with it's possible but he but it, nobody saw him there so all that stuff you hear in the media about you know the ticket the, the Greyhound ticket lady and the guy in the diner total garbage total garbage and that's the stuff people believe oh see he was seen no never seen but could he have done it still yes um that's possible he it, you know he could de he definitely did all these things um yes um definitely um I don't believe the bus story because he needs to get away fast and change clothes and get rid of masks yeah, it's I mean he could have but just just no proof of it um so he had a van at some point supposedly he did now again uh when he when he kidnapped the girl on the 15th he had to have had some way to remove her from the house and take her to a certain location so yes he had to have a vehicle whether it was his vehicle his mommy's vehicle he got it from the the, the car shop he was working on whether he stole it don't know but and and a lot of times he did take buses and, and all this stuff he was he was a drifter so sometimes he had a vehicle sometimes he didn't have a vehicle but there is zero proof that, that it makes any sense that he was seen at these two locations because if he did do the crime he came in the van that he left in and then went and committed the next crime so let's just say Tommy Lynn Sells could have done it but with a van and this the, and the sightings are garbage so now we're going solely on his confession okay now we have no we have no eyewitnesses now we just have a confession now here's the problem with the confession so let's go back to what is said by um Di uh, diane uh, she says that she wrote him she saw this 2020 thing she said oh my god that could be Tommy lynn sells she could be right could have been Tommy lynn sells i i totally have no problem with that that concept that it could be Tommy lynn sells so she writes him and he writes back this statement uh, was that like maybe two days before my Springfield murder okay all right um and she says uh she did not give him extra information that he wouldn't have known more now she's pointing out he's on death row and and I looked up this death row issue because a lot of death row has things like televisions and you know you get together with other inmates and you have you know exercise time you have a lot of privileges apparently at that time in, in Texas they, they had just made it made a complete lockdown of the place so all the privileges that he would have had like a year before were gone so truly he was in that cell like 23 hours a day he could only exercise alone there was no tv sounds they say you like you know she could be right you know what the heck you know how did he come up with this well let me give you two ways and this is again my problem with presenting stuff in the media where you don't bother to give the op some other information one if he's from st louis and he's hanging around st louis don't you think that the lawrenceville murder of a little boy in the home would have been on the tv my guess is it is on the tv so let's say he was just sitting there with mommy the sick mommy and he's like oh yeah let me watch some tv oh look oh shoot some some kid got hey somebody went to some lady's house and, and stabbed her kid up <laughs> that sounds good to me and then he's like bye ma gotta go and he goes on to springfield and says i'm gonna go get my own and he might remember two days before i went to springfield I'm, i heard this crap on, on on the tv it was on the tv news tommy could have known it from that that's one way okay so that's one way secondly can anybody else tell me exactly who you have contact with in prison 
if you're even on, even if you're on death row, folks, even if you're on death row, who do you have contact with? <laughs> what seems very convoluted. It, it's a it's a tricky. Are you talking about my my show or the 2020 one? If, if you're getting confused, that's because that's the point. Um, the they, the media tells you one thing that she was wrongfully she was wrongfully convicted because of uh, uh, a a overzealous prosecutor. Then they found out about Tommy Sells, and they found out that there were witnesses put Tommy Sells in the area, and he confessed to it. It's that simple. But yet the witnesses are not provable, and he most likely had a van, so it doesn't make any sense. But yes, that's it, Benny, a lawyer. Even if, even if here in, you're in in, in us. On death row, you got a lawyer. And what is your lawyer trying to do? Prevent you from getting executed. Now, one way to prevent people from getting executed is to get them to confess to crimes because that delays their execution. If they got to, you know, hey, they want to talk to you. They want, maybe they even want to prosecute, prosecute you in another state. It all depends on the states and what anybody's willing to do. But it gets you attention and it, you know, there, and anything that extends your death date you can hope that by that time the state gets rid of the death penalty and then you'll just live forever. So a lawyer, you got a guy in there who's on your side to get you from, keep you from being executed. All Tommy has to do is go, hey, the lady who's writing me, she says, talking about this murder in Missouri. I mean, she was talking about this murder about this kid being stabbed, but she said she saw it on some television show. Can you check that out for me? Guy comes back, yeah, it was 2020. So what it happened like uh, two days before that, the one you killed. Uh, oh, okay, thanks. And and uh, that, they say he's saying a lot of things even early that he wouldn't have known. Well, they were in the television show. Or, guess what? They were in the first trial because I looked at the first trial transcript and the information is there. So the, a lot of stuff they say he came up with we, he couldn't have gotten any place is not true. It was, it was right there in the first trial. Uh, so that's a problem. Um, yeah, there's, I don't know, the, the one thing, Doreen, we don't know, well, he's not talking to other prisoners, the guards, yes, that's possible, people who write you letters, uh, Diane wasn't necessarily his only person he was writing letters, and she never says exactly how long it was between the time she asked him and the time he responded, was that 48 hours, or was it a month, and did he have a month to find out this information from somebody and say, hey, yeah, I'm going to go with this one, we don't know. So again, we have stuff being presented as fact, which we have no proof as fact. Okay, so I don't necessarily believe Tommy Lynn Sells wasn't fed the information, and that's what the prosecutor thinks. He thinks Tommy Lynn Sells was fed information from somewhere, and he doesn't believe it for a minute. He didn't believe those witnesses, and he doesn't believe Tommy Sells. So let's just take Tommy Sells now and say, okay, we don't have proof of Tommy Sells. Could, could... Or is there, is there, what about this crime about um, Julie Ray? Why did they, why did they suspect her so much in the beginning? Was there anything there that really stood out? And I'm going to tell you, yes, there is. All right. Let me, let me tell you what I have a problem with. And um, just blew me away when I saw this stuff. I'm like, how was nobody talking about, there's two main issues about this. All right, I'm just going to go back to this. All right. Her story is that, well, by the way, her story changes. Sometimes she says she hears a scream, and then she runs to this area and encounters this man, sometimes jumping over the bed, sometimes jumping from the bed, sometimes in the doorway. Other times she said she like woke up to seeing a guy over her in her own bedroom, and she jumps up. Okay. There is no way she could have seen the room is the way you, you saw the room. Let's go back and look at the room again. This is the room. He can be behind the bed. He could be. There's a lot of places this boy can be. It's dark in the room. It's about you. Let's say you come into the room like I'm coming in the room now. Ah, and this guy jumps at me. Boom. Right now, the next thing that happens is they fight all the way down the hallway. And remember how the prosecutor said nothing was disturbed in the house. So he would have had to get in the house, go into the kitchen grab the knife and not disturb anything possible. But now he's jumping on her and there's nothing disturbed. And they're fighting all the way down the hallway. She's claiming 
in her stories that she was grabbing him by the lake and he was dragging her down the hallway and she was clutching onto him, holding onto him, trying to prevent him from leaving. And then he finally breaks free and gets through the door and she chases him into the yard. Does anybody see the problem I see right here? What, what is wrong with this story that should send up a massive red flag? Somebody do tell me. Because I think it's the weirdest damn thing I ever heard. What do you think? What is really, really off about this story? Can anybody think about yourself in that situation? What's wrong with the story? Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Doreen. Why doesn't she want him to leave? Good God. There's a, there's a crazy guy in your house. The guy is a threat to your son. He's trying to leave your house. You want him to go away. <laughs> the last thing you want to do is keep him in your damn house. You want him to get out of my house and call 911. If he's running away, you can call 911 really quickly. But instead, you're trying to hold him in your house. You're trying to chase him down and keep him there. What in the heck? Does this make any sense? It doesn't absolutely make any sense at all. Uh, yes, and she should be afraid of being next. Also, interestingly enough, she supposedly has a black belt in karate. Now, I, I've, taken, I've taken martial arts and I also took taekwondo, which is what she took. Let me tell you. The last thing you want to do is try to be to try to hang on to the person because they're they're a male and the chances of them hurting you once they get a hold of you they're they can choke you they can keep they push you on the ground and they'll kill you so what you want to do is actually get distance from them and if anything she's got taekwondo she's a black belt damn it punch this dude punch him elbow him kick him in the you know use your you use your snap kick use your Use your sidekick. Use something. He's going down the hall. Kick the son of a bitch. She never punched. She never kicked. She's holding on to him, trying to keep him in the house. What in the world? What in the world? So, like you say, it might, first of all, she could get more injured. And secondly, her son is in the house. She should want the guy out of her house. Okay. Yes. Why would you keep a killer? Well, she doesn't know he's a killer. Now, this, is, this gets interesting, too. At this point... She doesn't know what he's done. Supposedly, he didn't. This is another interesting point the prosecutor made. If he just stabbed this child to death, why is the knife not in his hand to go stab her to death? And if she encounters him, why isn't he stabbing the living crap out of her? She gets so lucky that somehow the knife leaves his hand. It ends up in the hallway, apparently not even dropped. Um, the defense says, oh, yeah, because he wiped it on his clothes and then left it there. Okay, sure. And, and now... Now he's just trying to get away instead of stabbing her. He's already stabbed her son to death. Why wouldn't he stab her to death? Because what is she? Somebody tell me what she is. She is a witness. Now, of course, when they get out, he takes his mask off so he can say, look, I wore a mask so that you wouldn't, you know, wouldn't see my face, but let me take my mask off so now you can identify me. And he doesn't like to leave witnesses alive, so he'll kill a kid if the kid's a witness, but he's going to not rape her not kill her, and is going to remove his mask so that she can identify him. This is the stupidest story I ever thought. Wait a minute, this is funny. <laughs> Maybe she thought he had cocaine. <laughs> Maybe. So, <clears throat> okay. Let's, uh, Lisa says, let's say she did it, and she made up this intruder and possibly injured herself. Possibly. Now, uh, let's go on to what happened next. Okay, we'll get to the injuries in a little bit. So next, after she's in the backyard, okay, now here, here's the next thing that, okay, let's go to the backyard. She's now in the backyard. Where's the backyard? Backyard, backyard. Where'd it go? Where'd the backyard go? I had a backyard. Oh, that was not, <laughs> I hate it when I do that. That's the front yard. Okay, so she's in, she's, okay, this is the front of her house. She's, there's, uh, the backyard is where she says she, he ends up hitting her head into the ground, and then he shows her his face to her, and then um, there it is. Uh, this, and then she's in this backyard, and now he runs away. He runs away. Okay, all my folks who are parents, what would you do at that moment? 
the, the, the attacker, whoever, your home invader, has now run out. He, she says he sauntered away, which is even weirder. Okay, but he's now left. What is the very next thing you do? Tell me, what's the very next thing you would do? And this probably is the, the key in my case, my opinion to this case. And it was not even mentioned by the prosecutor. So the, I don't think they had the greatest prosecutor. Really, Martin? Ah, Martin says, call the police. Really? No. Lisa's right. Go to my child. Look, she didn't see him in the bed. She, well, first of all, the first claim is she never even saw him. She never looked in the room. It was dark. So that's all garbage. But she later said she didn't see him in the bed. But you see in the room. He was, let's look where he was. He was found. He was found behind the bed. Okay. He was found right there behind the bed because there's room behind the bed, between the bed and the wall. Now, think about this. That guy was in the room with your kid and you somehow after failing to keep him in your house and wasting all that time and he's finally got away. You would think your first thought would be, oh my God, I've got to get to my child. He might be injured. I don't know what this guy did to him. Maybe he beat him. Maybe he suffocated him. Maybe he stabbed him. I don't know what he did to him. Maybe he raped him. I don't know. Maybe he's in there crying for his mommy. I would run right. It's not like she's far away. You, it would take literally 30 seconds to open up the door and run to his room to see what happened to her son and to administer aid if he needs aid. But does she do that? Oh, no, she doesn't do that. She completely ignores whatever happened in the house. She ignores her son and she goes to the neighbor's house and beats on their door. Help, help, four o'clock in the morning. Um, they're asleep. She's killing time. You know the other thing she has in her house? And you did mention that. Uh, you did mention that, uh, Martin. Call the police. What do you think she had in her house? It's called a phone. <laughs> you know, so what gets the police there quicker? Going to your neighbor's house and trying to wake them up and explain things to them and then get the phone call made and use their phone or just run into your damn house and call, on the, call the police 911. And while you're there, you can check on your damn kid but she doesn't check on her child. Now, if she runs next door, let's assume the child is even not dead and is okay. You know, the guy never hurt him, but he's hiding, like hiding in the closet or hiding behind the bed or under the bed. Because actually, I think you can hide under that bed. Yeah, you could actually, probably you could kick the guy under that bed. Um, she, the kid's now going, mommy, mommy, help me, mommy. And his mommy's gone. He thinks maybe his mommy's dead because there was a big bad guy in his house. And now mommy's off with the neighbors. Paying no attention to him at all. He's just sitting there going, Mommy, Mommy, Mommy. He's only 10. Now, he doesn't come to look for her either. No. She gets to the neighbor's house. <sighs> she gets to... <laughs> Well, that's probably true. She didn't check on him if she did because she already knew. That is actually accurate. Exactly. She already knew he was dead behind the bed. So... That's why she didn't check on him, in my opinion. That would be the real reason. I'm not saying she did or didn't. I'm, she's been given a proclamation of innocence, a certificate of innocence. But the one reason people don't check on people is because they already know what happened. And there's no way she would have known he was had been killed. There's no way she should have known he was even injured because she didn't even know about the knife. You know what I mean? So she didn't know if he had been beaten, I say, or, or raped or just uh, suffocated with a pillow or maybe perfectly fine, but scared out of his little mind. She didn't go back and check on her own son. She goes to the neighbor's house and she doesn't immediately call the police. She goes and tries to wake people up and kill another five minutes, maybe 10 minutes, getting these people out of damn bed. Now the people come and open up the door and she's like, oh, know what she says? She says he's gone. And then she said, ask the neighbor, she said, they've taken him. Well, Somebody, uh, what's wrong with this thing? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Doreen, again, didn't she say he was kidnapped? She did. But where was her son while she fought the bad guy, if that were the case? Who, the guy, the guy left without her son. There's no reason for her to think he was kidnapped. Now, if she went into the room and found he wasn't there, and maybe there was a second guy who took him before the 
you know, like a one guy took him out of the house and the second guy she encountered could be true. But she never checked to see if her son was even in the room and injured. She had no reason. All she knew, as far as we could see, was one guy was in the house. One intruder, which she tried to keep in the house, and then chased out of the house, tried to keep him in the yard, and then he finally gets away without a child in his arms. So why would you go to the neighbors and say he's been kidnapped? Does that make any sense? No. So then she tells the neighbor to go check for her son in the house, and the neighbor's like, oh, if he's been kidnapped, why would he be in the house? So the neighbor goes over here. The dude goes over and he goes in the house and he finds Joel dead behind the bed. I believe she wanted somebody to find him and not her. You know, um, that's usually the way you do it. You get somebody else to find the body. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, you're confused. You're con you know, Lisa, you're confused because it makes no sense. <laughs> that's why you're confused. Exactly. Okay. Now, while she's at the, the neighbor's house, there's a lady who is a nurse, um, and she is this lady. Um, let me get this lady up here. I think it's this one. Nancy C. She's a, she's an RN, and she's, um, I, I forget, there's so many people involved here at this point. There's people, she went to somebody's house, and then somebody else came, and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, she is now, she's an RN, so she's going to take care of her, quote, wounds. And one of her wounds is, is, is a cut on her shoulder, I believe, arm, shoulder, arm, somewhere. Anyway, um, and... She says she's trying to like clean it up, but she doesn't want to overdo it because she thinks maybe there's DNA. And so Nancy, Nancy is trying to like do some cleaning. She says to her, oh, don't worry, I don't have AIDS. And Nancy's like, so what? Like, what? Your son is like missing, what? And then she pulls up her knee and she goes, I have a boo-boo on my knee. And Nancy's like, little, <laughs> talk about red flags, it's like, who says that? Your son could be kidnapped. Your son could be dead. And you're worried about a boo-boo on your knee. A boo-boo on your knee. <clears throat> okay. Sure you are. Boo-boo on your knee. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah, think, Lisa. I would check on my kid before holding on to his leg. That dude, I want that dude out of the house. Um, look for my child. Yeah. See, this is, this is, this is where I'm having, Martin says, I'm not in good form tonight. Well, you know, is the whiskey getting to you? <laughs> or, wait a minute, wait a minute, what time is it in England? I'm going to give you a break. Maybe you're just really tired. This is, no, Mark, Martin, this is a convoluted case. And the problem is, as they started out by saying she didn't, she did it, and then she didn't do it, and then they get the Innocence Project there, and they get, they get um, Diane Fanning with her book, and the, and the Confessions of Tommy Sells. That's why I took you all the way through that, and then bringing you all the way back, because there's no proof. There's no actual proof that Tommy Sells was in the location. There's certainly no proof he was on any damn bus. So if he went, he went with a vehicle, stopped her, went to her home. I'm okay with that. But the whole story that she tells is so bizarre. When, when people say, oh, the and I've seen it. I looked at the comments on, you know, I see the 2020 show. Actually, there's only a, I can't find the 2020 show. There's a, a version of it on YouTube, which is really really like somebody it's a it's a they they steal it basically and then they do these weird things to it so it won't be tracked as being the 2020 show as so like a copyright violation and it's horribly done but you can get the gist of it um and everybody was commenting that prosecutor is horrible he just he was so cruel to her she was you know, she was a loving mother and how could he do this i'm like i'm not saying i personally don't think he was the best prosecutor because he didn't point out these two things why the hell would you keep a guy in your house who is dangerous to you? Why would you hang on to him? Why wouldn't you beat him if you're a, a black belt, for God's sakes? And why would you never go back in the house to check on your son and spend your time going to the neighbor's house and not you, know, you have a phone in your house? Why wouldn't you check on your son and then call 911? These things do not make sense, and he did not bring that up, and I do not understand why he failed at that. Um, but those, to me... When I looked at this case, when Benny came to me and said, hmm, you know, check out this case. You know, when I first started, I'm like, okay, finally, <laughs> finally, I'm going to agree with the Innocence Project that this woman did not do it. This is not a Darlie Routier. Routi Why do you say that woman's name? Routier. I always want to say Routier because it's French looking. But I thought it was a Darlie Routier thing. I mean, and then when I started reading about it, I'm like, oh, you know, 
maybe it's not. Here is it. Finally, an innocent person that the Innocence Project has done a good thing. And my friend, Diane Fanning, who may not be a friend anymore, but not, not, she's a good author, friend. Okay, I'm in trouble. Okay, so, <laughs> you know, maybe she's innocent. Maybe she really, and she was found not guilty from the second jury. And and on top of that, she got the certificate certification of innocence. This may be a time when uh, when she was somebody was wrongly accused of killing their child who didn't do it. But then I started looking at the first. I remember I said I went to Reddit and found the first actual trial. That's where I found out what really happened and what she said and what she did. And when I saw that, I'm like, holy God, there's something so wrong with this. And the three things were, you don't hold the guy in your house that's trying to kill you, maybe harming your child, and, and you don't not go back in and check on your child, and you don't waste time calling the police. She did three things that made no sense. And then she, and then the other weird, there's a lot of other weird little commentaries and, and changing of her story about where the guy was and where the guy wasn't, and there's all the evidence, there's lack of evidence of a stranger being there. All of those things are there, but those were the big things that just stood out to me. <laughs> Someone, Benny, find a find Pat a case where the Innocence Project is right. You know, that you know, I don't have a problem with the Innocence Project being right. The problem I have is they have an agenda, and their agenda is against the death penalty, and they have tremendous money and tremendous media media input, and a lot of what they do they do has nothing to do with proving bringing the truth to light. It has to do with getting the guy out of prison and saying he's innocent when he's not. And that bothers me because once you do that one time, I stop trusting you, you know, because, you know, I don't want innocent people to be in prison. My God, I don't want that. But when you get a guilty guy out of prison, uh, some technicality, and then use all your media to, to confuse people and make them think that that's that, that that person's innocent is all get out and then they get all this money and they go, I'm, I'm not even angry at anybody who put me in prison. <laughs> really? <laughs> Probably because you're guilty. Um, I have problems with this because you're not truthful. And once you stop, I always told that to my kids. I said, the one thing I cannot tolerate in life is liars. Because, and never do it because once you lie, no one will ever trust you again. Just take the hit. If you, if you screwed up, you did something stupid, take the hit because at least people will trust you. But once you start lying to me, I'm done. Because I, 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 I can't trust you again because I know you will lie to me. The Innocence Project, in my opinion, does not always tell the truth. They're more interested in achieving their goals and therefore I have trouble with trusting them. Now, does that mean they don't sometimes get an innocent person out of prison? No, that doesn't mean that at all. It, it can happen, but just unfortunately, um, yeah, uh, find me a case where they did get an innocent guy out of prison, and I'd be happy to uh, promote that because I I want innocent people to get out of prison. I just want to make sure that you're not, you know, p pulling my leg on this, and that what happens is, as I said, they control the media like you would not believe. You sometimes have to go so far into Google and other search engines to even get any of the information about the actual crime to find the. Uh, uh, and somebody pointed out the other day the best thing about appeals was that. When they appeal, sometimes that information does stay on, on Google. So you can go to the appeal process and find out the facts of the case. It's like, oh, thank you very much for doing that because now I know some of the truth. So it's very interesting. Um, <laughs> they should call themselves a guilty project. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, I'm afraid to ask Pat to do Deborah Milke. If she says she's guilty, I will have to admit I'm a fool. <laughs> Wait a minute. Okay. I'm going to have to. No, okay. I got to look this one up now. Okay, eh, okay. I'm, I'm taking a picture of the thing so I can, Deborah Milky. Hmm. Okay. Um. The the nurse probably gave her the black eye following the boo-boo remark. Okay. Let me. She had. Um. Let me tell you about injuring yourself. Um. If you've committed a crime, first of all, we don't know if 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 for in. Again, she's been found. She's got a certification of certification of innocence. I am not saying she's guilty of the crime. But if she were to commit this crime, if anybody were to commit this crime, they can be injured in the commission of the crime. Um, and sometimes you can injure yourself. Now people, let me see if I, I don't have an, okay, I don't, I don't want to use a knife. I'm going to use my phone. <laughs> I'll injure my, I'm going to injure myself with a phone. <laughs> um, when you are doing violent things like this, 
it's not unusual that you actually come back and hit your damn self in the face with your own with your own hand because you are in such a frenzy you can whack yourself to death doing that you there are ways to injure yourself without even the other person the other person might be fighting back and they may injure you but you can also injure yourself without even trying i mean it, it, it could be that she that that some some actual injuries might be because it just happened um for example the the claim about the door the cut on her arm she had said that he smashed the door and that didn't like there were issues with the how where the glass ended up and believe me when the new defense team came in oh they found somebody to come up with another expert opinion on how that really happened you see you can always come up with another expert opinion in opposition so but let's say she was staging it and she smashed the door herself she could have cut herself on the damn door just staging it um she has some scratches on her body you know you can scratches are not that hard to get <laughs> they're easy to do um she she could have decided she better look a little bit banged up she could have ran into door frames just hit herself on something i mean you can there's just so many ways she had very minor injuries and the, the problem with the minor injuries is that you got a sadistic serial killer because tommy lynn sells is a sadistic serial killer he would have slit the hell out of it he loved slitting throats that was his big thing actually it was not so much stabbing or slitting throats he loved to do that crap and he liked to rape so i mean you got a woman there you can rape her you can cut her throat and you do nothing but let her let her hang on your leg while you drive drag her down the hallway and supposedly oh my god see that's where the that's where the rug burns on my on my legs came from you can get rug burns on your legs doing that not being dragged down the hallway you can there's you know the thing is they're trying to come up with a story to cover everything but what you can't cover is the fact she never went in to look to see if her son was okay she went didn't go back to save her son from what might have been he might have been dying in there he might have been dying and needed cpr but she was too busy going over to her to the neighbor's house and talking about her boo-boos you know um joel uh, the joel Kirkpatrick's father still believes that she's guilty not saying he's right i'm just saying he still believes did they have any pets uh, not that i know of <laughs> Um, I've hit myself in the face while boxing. Not fun. Oh my God. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I have injured myself with martial arts and boxing because I, I've done boxing too. I mean, sometimes, oh, I've been oh, here, here. I'm going to show you some. I have injured myself doing sign language interpreting. You think that's impossible? Sign language? Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my glasses off. So I don't. <laughs> but I have done that. One time I had a, had a, um, I had a necklace on. I had a, had an African bird on it with a big fat beak, and I went to sign, excited, and I went, and I flipped the freaking bird up and stabbed myself in the eye. With it. <laughs> and I have done other things like, you know, this is a sign for no, but I've hit myself too hard. I've hit myself in the eye. Um, there's there's many signs that you can do, and you can just accidentally stab yourself or punch yourself, or you're just even explaining, like you know, he punched himself in the face, and then you're like, oh, okay. I didn't need to do that. <laughs> There's a lot of ways to hurt yourself, even not on purpose. But on purpose, it's not that hard. I mean, if, if I just stab my son to death and I, I don't want to be taken away for it, I'm having no issue about taking this phone and whacking my damn self in the head with it so I can have a little bruised up eye. I have no problem with scratching myself up. You know, whatever I have to do to roll around on the rug to make myself look like I, I was in a struggle. She should, now they say the problem is why wouldn't she done a better job? You know, knock some of the things on the wall off. Why would the job be so poorly done? I don't know. You know, that's a good question. If I were in a courtroom and I were a defense lawyer, I'd say that. I'd say, well, you know, she didn't stage it very well. well that would be true. So maybe it's just this freaky thing where she struggled with a guy and for whatever reasons, they just never hit those spots on the wall. But if she had really killed her son, she would have made it look better. You think? But you'd be surprised how dumb people are when they try to stage crimes or that they don't actually stage it. They don't do much at all because they're just, their minds are like in a weird place. But I still can't get past. Why the heck didn't she check on her son? Yeah. Did the prosecution ask her why she didn't check on the child? 
Lisa, um, I can't find that. I cannot find that. That's why I said I can't understand where the prosecution. I, I looked through the, I, unless I missed it, which is possible because, as you know, it's long. I thought I went through the entire trial transcripts. I did not see that. And it shocked me because my first question was, why the hell didn't you run back in to check on your son? Why didn't you make that a big deal in court? Because that makes it look really terrible. I mean, that's, that's what I do as a lawyer, you know. I, I, I hit on that real quick. You didn't care about your son, you know. Why, why do you want to keep the guy in the, in the house with your son? Why would you want to keep a dangerous person in the house with your son? Why did you not go check on your son? Why did you not go right away and call 911 from your house instead of going someplace else, which delayed the you know, ability to supposedly find your missing son who was never missing to begin with? I, I mean, I could tear that crap up, but I, I didn't see it. I did not see it. <laughs> Martin, she didn't stage it well because she's dumb. Possibly, you know, people aren't that smart. <laughs> people are dumb shits. I mean, I hate to say it, but you know, especially when if you commit a crime, um, whether you're, whether you're, wh who, whoever you are, whether you're, whether you're Tommy Lynn Sells or, or you're Julie Ray, whoever committed this crime, you can do stupid shit. And people don't want to, they always think that there's these masterminds behind this stuff, and they're not masterminds. They start doing things, things go amiss, and they get confused, and they, then they try to just, like, fix things, or they try not to fix things, and they try to run. They don't know. A lot of times it's just really pitiful. I mean, it, it truly is pitiful. So things go wrong. Um, yes, S psych, <laughs> you, you got it, psychology. Mm. Um, <laughs> that is concerning. Um, <laughs> let me go back and see what else you have to say. Um, <laughs> wait, I got to read this, Molly. There once was a man named Tommy. Don't know if he had a bad mommy. He said he killed much, so cops in a clutch said he did it and caused, caused a tsunami. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's very good. Ah, that's a very, that is excellent. <laughs> I love it. Um, so Bunny says, we cannot conclude that Julie Ray killed Joel, but the totality of evidence does not leave much room for reasonable doubt in my mind, so the original jury was right. Um, I lean toward Benny, because I, I know I scared, I scared Benny because, because Benny's like, oh, you know, I think she didn't do it. Uh, I mean, she did do it. I think she did do it. Um, and then I said, well, you know, Benny, you might be surprised after you watch this video, you know, about what I say. And so well, I was teasing him. But I, I tend to agree with you, Benny. Um, uh, I find that the evidence points to toward her guilt. I find there is zero evidence that supports Tommy Lynn Sells committed the crime, although he could have. Uh, and I definitely, definitely think that the Innocence Project trying to paint it on him with these witnesses that make no sense whatsoever, since I will agree with Diane Fanning that he drove, he had a vehicle at the time, he had a van, and at least that makes sense. So I'll give Diane uh, Fanning credit on that. She didn't, she did have the story that he had the van coming and going from Lawrenceville. Uh, so if he committed the crime, he was in a van. Um, and these witnesses do not exist. Uh, they, they exist, but they're just wrong. Um, and so the Innocence Project is trying to trump up stuff that they put on the, the media again and nobody pays attention because they think it's correct. They, they, they say, oh, oh my God, you know, these people saw him. No, they didn't. Um, so you got the choice between just a confession and the fact he might have ha might like did have a van um, and, and the weird stuff that Julie Ray says that makes no sense for a stranger homicide. Um, so I'm going to leave you. You can you can you can choose choose which one you want to go with, because she has been given a certificate of innocence. So she's she's free, and, and as according to the state, uh, she is innocent. Uh, not only not guilty, but she has been given a certificate of innocence. So um, I will say that um, that's as it stands legally. I just find the crime a little. The, what what happened at the crime scene and what what she, her statements just don't work for me as far as a stranger being in her home and uh, yeah I have a problem with it so <laughs> Delisa says I'm so impressed with the analytical skill skills teach me well that's what the show that's what this whole pro this whole thing is about <clears throat> it's not so much again about 
whether I'm proving somebody's right, uh, guilty or not guilty, but just the, the issues behind the case. Because when Benny asked me to look at this, and I started seeing that there were people that, you know, he bought the ticket and all this stuff. I'm thinking, oh, maybe he did. Maybe he's just, he's a drifter. He could take buses different places. And I'm like, oh. and then I'm reading Diane Fanning's things. And I'm like, wait a minute, there's two different stories here. So wh where did the van come from? And then, so things don't start matching. And I'm like, what frustrates me is that it's being presented as fact, not as interesting stuff that doesn't really match. And let's try to figure out what's true and what isn't, but that this is being presented as fact to the public. So the, the public gets the media spin, especially from the Innocence Project, because they own the media. Um, they get the media spin and they stop questioning and they stop saying, you know, there just might be some room for doubt here, but you know, not so much. Um, uh, and Christine says, home invasion, you should remain exactly where you are. If you feel the intruder is there to harm you or they're closing in on your position, escape may be best not to attack the intruder. Who does that? I mean, I can't even imagine why you would chase an intruder. Why would you do that? Why would you want to keep the intruder in your home when he's, you know, possibly dangerous? That makes absolutely zero sense. You should be thankful the hell he wants to get the hell out of there. It's like, oh, thank God he's leaving. <laughs> you know, I mean, this, 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 uh, I can't, you know, and that, she didn't use any karate techniques. I have a real issue with that. I'm like, you took martial, you're a black belt. You don't know how to throw a punch. The dude's right in front of you. He's jumping at you and you ha you're, you're, you're not throwing a punch. I'm sorry, because because I've taken martial arts. I'm telling you, if I see a dude in front of me, I don't have my nine millimeter. I'm, I'm going to go for the, I'm going to go, I'm going to start punching because my kid's in the house. I'm going to start trying to knock him out, you know, and if he runs from me, because he's scared of me, I'm all happy with that. You can run out of the house, you jackass. I'm going to check on my kid, call 911. It's pretty simple. Mm -mm -mm. <sighs> pretty simple. But apparently not looking at it that way. <laughs> I think she should have her innocence certificate taken back. You know, I didn't even know, K-Rob, that, the, that there was such a thing. And I was like, what? Apparently this is big in Illinois and it's spreading. Now it's in Indiana too. And a few other places are trying to push for these uh, certificates of innocence. And the concept is once you have been proven innocent or not guilty by the Innocence Project, then you can sue the crap out of the state because you were put in prison for no reason, for an erroneous prosecution, for even a, a, a crooked prosecution. And that's what they're trying to say in this case. She did get... I think she only got like 80,000 bucks because she wasn't in that long, but um, she's no longer married to the guy who married her um, and she's not having a good time. So I don't know what the issues with that is. Um, <laughs> Lisa says, I thought this case was pretty cut and dry at first. And so did I. And so did I. So I started reading more and I'm like, oh my God, I know it's just, you know, you always find out that if you really do the research, a lot of things just aren't as you they aren't as they seem and and I and I blame the media for that because they don't care about the truth and that that pisses me off because it's not a matter of trying to prove somebody's guilty or not guilty that's not really the media's place but they can present the facts which well, which was the media's place but they don't bother with that anymore you know so yeah um let's see what else we have to say here <laughs> um what motive uh, the, the motive, Carrie, was that she had lost custody of her child. Um, and and, 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 and they, they claim that was a terrible motive. And I'm going to say that's not a terrible motive. That's, that we have seen in many cases, usually men, who kill their wives and children because they lost custody. And they're like, if you can't have the kids, and not, or they won't even kill the wife, they'll just kill the kids. It's like, you can't have them. If I can't have them, you can't have them. And it's a very brutal and cruel thing to do, and it's sadistic, but it's... It's, it's, it's what, to show that I have power and control over you and you cannot do this to me. And there's no reason why a woman can't say the same thing. You know, you can't take my, my son away from me. If, if, if I can't have him at least half time, you can't have him at least half time either. You know, cause you get back to the, the King Solomon thing where, where, where the two, the, the baby is presented by two women and, and, and they say one woman, the one woman says it's my son and the other one says it's my son or my baby. I don't know, it's a son or daughter, but anyway, probably back in those days, they'll call it a son. Anyway, so it's my son and it's, oh, it's my son and it's a baby, right? And so King Solomon says, okay, we'll solve the problem. We'll just cut the baby in half and you can have one half and you can have the other half. And one of the women 
one woman says, okay. <laughs> and the other one goes, oh, no, no, give her the baby. And at that point, King Solomon knows who the mother is, that she'd rather save her son's life and give it to the child, the other woman, than have her son murdered. But those are good mothers. <laughs> there are many mothers and fathers who are willing to have that kid cut in half. They are. And so King Solomon had a, a, a great, uh, a great it, you know, in court, he presented what appeared to be a very good methodology. But if you're dealing with psychopathy and you're dealing with other issues, a lot of times that doesn't hang in. <laughs> that doesn't hang in at all. Um, wasn't it the last time before he was going to his father's? That's suspicious timing. Uh, I can't remember, Doreen. It might have been... Um, I have uh, so much information here, I've, I've lost about 50% of it. So <laughs> I'm not sure. But it's certainly a timing, you know, it's time with her, you know, was ending as far as her control over, you know, the physical custody. So there's no question about that. Um, I see no value in a certificate of innocence. If the person is indeed innocent, the acquittal should be enough. No, no, no. The acquittal says you're not guilty. It doesn't say you're innocent. A piece of paper proves nothing. It's gimmicky. Oh, no. It, once you're proved innocent, then you can accuse. See, if you're only not guilty, you can't accuse a state of doing something bad to you because it's just that the, this jury didn't find you guilty. But if you're proven innocent, then you can go after the state. That's the whole point of it. You're supposed to go after the state. Uh, why was the child behind the bed? Uh, I guess he was just stabbed a lot and fell behind the bed. <laughs> That's it. There was a space. So, you know, if he's being stabbed and, you know, or maybe he's being hidden. Um, don't know, but that's where he ended up. So, yeah. Um, uh, does the certificate affect double jeopardy issues? Uh, that's an interesting point. I don't know. I think, you know, once you, they've been declared not guilty by the court, you're pretty much good to go. Um, you know, and I think it's just a, a, a good stamp especially the innocence project is behind these certificates. They want the person to be declared innocent so that they can then say, what was done to me? Um, I've been proven innocent. Not that I'm just not, I've been found not guilty. Because remember, not guilty is simply that you might have had reasonable doubt and you just couldn't quite be sure that the person did it. Now, I could see a jury coming up with a uh, reasonable doubt in the case of uh, Julie uh, Julie, right, because they just couldn't understand the motive, maybe. Uh, they thought maybe somebody could have come in, and even though her behaviors were really weird, that she was just a weirdo. And and they did try to present that she had a, maybe, maybe a concussion, so she started saying stupid things. Okay, um, so I can see, you know, you have to get a jury to agree, and they didn't agree, so they came up with enough reasonable doubt from a couple jurors, and that was that, so they found her not guilty. Not guilty doesn't mean that they're innocent. But if you can give them a certificate of innocence, you're saying without a shadow of a doubt that she's innocent, that she was wrongly prosecuted, then the state is liable for uh, for for uh, railroading her, essentially. So, yeah. Uh, Joe Stunner says, <laughs> Joe says, this show is fascinating stuff, but I have to say I'm beginning to think I wouldn't be much of a pro criminal profiler. My head hurts. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. The, well, this this case particularly, it, 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 it was like it was like trying to um, backtrack on everything. And, and believe me, I felt the same way. I'm like, what? 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 And, I, you know, I was trying to figure out how I'm going to present this so I can show you what the media put out and then backtrack to what the truth is. But, yeah, um, I can't blame you on this one, Joe. This one, this one was very, it's very convoluted, um, mostly because of uh, information that's being presented as fact, which is not fact. So, yeah, it, it, it's a bit of a tricky, a tricky, tricky whole thing here. Um Benny says, thank you very much, Pat, for all your research and the way you presented the case. The focus on what a profiler finds suspicious. It was really a pleasure and we're learning a lot. Well, I'm glad you're happy, Benny, because, you know, I did, you know, believe me, you know, if I found, I, I, if I found nothing suspicious about the uh, Certificate of Innocence, if I thought that there's no way this woman did it, and Tommy Lee, to, I mean, sorry, Tommy Lynn sells, God, this guy's good for it, I would have said that, you know, because, um, 
For a woman, for anybody to be put in prison for the murder of their child if they didn't commit it is horrific. But on the other hand, if you did do that, it's pretty horrific that you're out in public. Um, and I, again, I'm not saying she's guilty. I'm just saying that there's no proof that Tommy Lynn Sells is, and there's enough suspicious things that she said and did that just make my make me question. That's all I can say. Um, no, there was not. There's no DNA in this crime at all. No DNA. Um, so that that doesn't exist in this. Um, <laughs> that's just terrible. I bet Ray, I bet Ray got a I've been a brave girl sticker. Oh, that's so mean. <laughs> I mean Oh, thank thank you, Doreen. I appreciate that. I'm not saying that you have to agree with me. You know, I I never tell people they have to agree with me. Um also just to want to point that out. Um again, my think my, my show is about education, not not proving I'm right or wrong, not proving that, you know, whatever. Um but that I want you to understand what I would go through as a profiler to analyze this case and what would pop up to me to be things that are concerning, uh, 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 that are suspicious, that don't make sense, um, and how I would then, if I were, uh, if I were um, advising the police on this and did a profile on the case, I would say, I can't get past these three things that she said, that she didn't check on her child, she didn't run to the house to, get, to call 911, and, and that she wasted all this time and that she tried to keep a, 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 a dangerous guy in her house and didn't use, didn't use uh, martial arts. These are the things that just stand out to me. I would check on those things. And then when they said, what about Tommy Lynn Sells? I'd say, well, first of all, the witnesses, just, it's just garbage because if he did these crimes, he clearly had a vehicle for him to be able to go there, commit the crime, stalk her, and then come back all the way to Springfield and take that girl, which is proven he had a vehicle at the time he did that. So either he suddenly got a vehicle. <laughs> this is this is what doesn't make sense. So he goes to he goes to Lawrence. I'm not sure it's Lawrenceville. What is the name of that town? I've already forgotten. He goes there on what? I mean, on what a bus and ends up there. And then he wanders around for a couple of days, goes in a diner, wanders down a track, and accidentally ends up at her home. And then kills the boy for no reason, which you can figure. And then he suddenly ends up, you know, going southeast to end up in another town where he picks up a bus ticket. And then he, instead of, you know, then he goes back to, back to St. Louis at 4.30 in the afternoon. Remember, he's got to be in Springfield by 11 to kidnap this girl. So we're talking about 4.30 to 11 is only six and a half hours. And so what does he do? Walk, he has to get from the bus station to his mother's because he's supposed to be, he's theoretically supposed to be seeing his mother. And, hi, Mom, how you doing? You're still sick. Okay, good, go, goodbye. <laughs> and then he's got to go back to the bus station and buy a separate ticket to Springfield because there isn't a ticket that goes to, wait a minute, he has to have a van. Okay, so maybe he goes to the company he worked for and pulls up a van out of there, um, pulls a van from his mother's house. And okay, so now it's like whatever, 5.30, 6 o'clock, and then he has to race over to Springfield to start doing his stalking. I mean, we're talking about a hell of a tight, tight time frame if you're going to have him for any reason taking buses. <laughs> but that he had a van already just to drive out there, you know, for whatever reasons, kill the kid, and then drive back, see mom, and go on, that makes more sense. So stick with the, you know, it's odd that they don't stick with what makes more sense. But what they wanted, what the Innocence Project wanted, was to have witnesses to say they saw him, even if he didn't look seven, even if they said he was 17 when he was 33. They want to come up with a stupid idea that we're going to convince you with the witnesses. And that's where you start getting this garbage. Now, that was, I don't know that that was presented in court because I never saw that. I don't know if they ever testified in court because, again, this could just could be media in 2020 because they don't give a crap about the truth. So now it's presented to the public, and once the public gets it, they start believing stuff that's just nonsense. And it bothers me because if you're going to put Tommy Lynn Sells in this, at least put him in the stupid van where he belongs. <laughs> you know? I mean, Diane Fanning did come up with the fact that he's claiming to have a you know, van at one point, and he, well, it was proven to have a van at one point because he killed the girl, and he really did. Um, in uh, Springfield and he had to have a van to do that so why wouldn't he have the van five days prior you know I mean or two wait a minute two days prior why wouldn't he have the van two days prior so 
they're even taking something that makes sense and distorting it for the purposes of people who never read anything will now say there's witnesses that put him there. So the more, because if he owns a van and could have driven to, to the town and killed Joel Kirk, Kirkpatrick, it doesn't mean he did. You see how that works? So in order to make it look like he did, they have to come up with witnesses that say he was there. So they're gonna dump the van, which is probably more realistic, and come up with this garbage to prove to the public that he was there. So you see, it's all deceptive garbage and it really pisses me off. <laughs> so I just find that, I mean, I don't, so Bill Clutter, sorry. I, you work for the Innocence Project and you'll do anything for the Innocence Project. That's my opinion. <sighs> and Martin says, I don't think the threshold was reached to give her a certificate of innocence. That's absolutely correct. She should not have gotten a certificate of innocence. That she was found not guilty is okay. Not that I agree with it, but that I can see that happening. That happened in a court of law. The jury found her not guilty and they should have left it at that, but me, they do some interesting stuff. Um, Molly says, thank you for presenting all the details in the case and pointing out all the inconsistency. Benny, thanks for being pleasantly pushy. <laughs> Benny's a squeaky wheel. And let me tell you guys, squeaky wheels do get some action. They do. I mean, because... You know, if, in other words, in case you forgot about this, Pat, how about this case that I've asked you about before? Yeah, okay, I'll look it up more. <laughs> Thank you, Annie. <laughs> so, um, uh, Lisa, it's a privilege watching how your mind works. Uh, does it work oh, when you dive into these cases? Not sure your sharp mind is teachable to the rest of us. Eh, everything is teachable. Everything is teachable because the problem what we don't usually get, Lisa, is that people are so busy snowing you because instead of telling you the way it works, you know, because it's, you know, I'm not very mysterious. I'm not the God of profiling or the goddess, the goddess of profiling. You know, it's like amazing. I can get into the mind of the killers. You know? Oh, that's kind of garbage. Um, and I'm telling you, Hey, this is why I'm looking at it. it. People don't like to give up their secrets. They want to be the one with the secrets because that apparently sells, you know, sells books. Um, and so what we have is we've had the FBI and others trying to make it appear as it as if there's some kind of magical thinking going on, but there isn't. It's 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 logic and it's reason and it's like wait a minute this does not make sense. And when when she wouldn't go back in the house and check on her own child, and she's right there, my God, she's right outside the house. She doesn't know what happened to her son, and she doesn't just run in the door. What, she's concerned about herself only? I mean, what? I mean, I can't, sorry, I can't get around it. I, I cannot imagine not going and checking on my child. I mean, and she's supposed to be this absolutely wonderful mother who just adores her child. And the first thing she thinks about is running away from the house as opposed to going in and seeing if her child is okay. Even if she thought somebody else could have taken my child, she should have said, but I don't know that. I never saw anybody taking my child out. I only saw one guy, this one guy who I tried to keep in the house and he ran away without my, oh, he walked away without my child. Therefore, my child could still be in the house and he could be injured. Just, uh, how can you not go in and check on that child then? And I'd like, I would have asked her that question. Now, I didn't see that asked, so I don't know who, who dropped the ball on that one. It drives me crazy. Mm -mm. <laughs> thank you very much and thank you very much. Um, she got the conviction overturned because she's a squeaky wheel. Well, there's a truth to that. She kept saying, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. And there's nothing that television and the Innocence Project likes better than somebody who claims innocence because it sells. It sells because, you know, it make, it's such a mystery. And it's like, oh, my God, we can do another show. And 2020 did two of them, you know. So they, 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 got, their, they got their stuff. Uh, and she tried to keep the intruder in her house. Yeah, I say I just can't get past the intruder. And yeah, let me let me keep you around here so you can hurt my son some more. You know, because you know, even though she claimed he was maybe 17 years old and and, and 130 pounds, uh, you know, she didn't actually say 130. She just said thin. Um, anybody who will break into your home, you have to be concerned about that they, they have a weapon, a gun. You know, there was no proof that he didn't have a gun. He could have pulled that out at any moment and shot her, that he had a knife. Um, 
that he could just beat the living hell out of her because I'm sorry, but a 17 year old boy and me, even if I had some martial arts training, you know, my chances aren't good because he's the boys are sorry about that. You know, people who just don't believe that there is a gender difference as far as, as, as um, abilities go. Yes, there is. Um, and you know, I, if I get a good punch in or two and he doesn't know what he's doing and I can actually, I'm a really good black belt. I could take him out. I, I only got to, I was going up for my blue belt when I, injured myself so i never got quite to the uh to the um did i have a blue belt might have had a blue belt i think i had a blue belt or was it only a green eh, anyway i think i was going for my blue when i got injured and then just never got back to it um but i'd done sparring and all that stuff and i was considered an excellent student at the june re academy in washington dc um and uh i could have fought and i've taken boxing too so i could fight um, but I still would know that I have to get really, I got to get really lucky. I got to catch that guy. And I don't know what he's got with him. If he's willing to invade my home, he may well have, be, have a weapon with him. And the one thing I don't want is, let's say he hurts me. Let's say he takes me out, knocks me unconscious. What's the next thing he's going to do? If my kid's still in the house, he's going to kill my, hurt my child. He's going to hurt my child. So the, what I want is me between him and my child. And I want him as far away from my child as he could get. And there's no way in hell I'm going to take the chance of trying to hold him and fight with him when he could hurt me and then go after my child. I'm going to make sure he goes out that damn door. You're damn straight. He's going to go out that door and I'll call 911. I'm not, I'm not, unless, I, you know, there's to makes no sense. The thing makes no sense. It drives me crazy. Mm, wow. Okay, then. Uh, let's see. Uh, Lisa says, edgy, contrarian shows that blur the truth. Blurring the truth is a great way to put it. Or pick a single strange fact to focus on are so popular. That is true. Uh, you're, you're fighting the, uh, the tide with your logic and insistence on separating fact and speculation. Yeah, this, but you see, unfortunately, what sells is that, like you point out, they find something to start, you know, making a show out of. Um, and, and, and they do. And they make these shows as soon as they can come up with it. You, people don't understand that there's there's this there's this room over at uh, twenty no what twenty who's twenty twenty with them forget but whatever, whatever network it is they're sitting around in a circle talking what can we come up with what would be a great show what 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 would really sell that's what they're looking for they're not going you know let's find let's find out the truth here <laughs> yeah that's not happening. Uh, uh, that's ah oh, really Gretchen I've done martial arts for nearly 10 years one of the first things they teach females is you're very unlikely to win a strength battle with a man <laughs> happy day absolutely um yes uh and and I want to I I've had, I don't know how long I've said this it's like that's why I hate those stupid those stupid self-defense classes for women that last for one night one evening or maybe three evenings and I'm, okay now girls we're going to teach how to punch like they do it like this like they can't even keep they don't even have a solid punch they got the the old girly punch thing it's horrible <laughs> and and they try to kick and they're like you know it's just it's just appalling but even so you know unless you know you're you're go, you're going up against a guy who's a heavyweight and you're a flyweight you're losing you know i mean only thing that can happen is if you catch them off guard and you can stun them for a minute and you can run <laughs> that's your chance but if you think you're gonna look at look at look at a look at a fight anybody's ever watched boxing or mma you punch somebody, they come back and punch you. You know, they don't like fall down immediately and then, oh, you won. I mean, unless you got a really great punch. So you out there in the ring and you like, you know, you, you punch in and they, they come back and then they, they, they boom, 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 boom. And now you die, you, now you on your back, you know, uh, <laughs> being raped because you're a female and a guy just punched him out. Okay. So, you know, it's ridiculous. So no, you don't do that. So if he's going to, if you're in that house trying to protect your son, you, you get between him and, and if for some reason you're able to get between him and your son and he's leaving, you're going to let him leave. If he comes back to attack your son, you can try what you can try. And if, if he really is a 17 year old, thin little, little like wimpy guy, well, maybe you could knock him out. Maybe you could do enough damage to then once you punched him and he fell down, you could pick up some heavy object and whack him over the head with it. Maybe you could do that. Got a gun per present. You could shoot him. But I'm going to say, once you've got that guy between, on the other side of you and your son is behind you, you're going to want got that guy to get the hell out of there. So I don't believe for a minute that she went through martial arts and didn't learn that basic crap. You know, mm -mm. sells, <laughs> sells, sells. That is true. 
It does. It does indeed. Yeah, you know, and it, because he's a creepy, creepy dude. Yeah. Yes, you'll break your wrist if you do girly punches. Oh my God, you, that's always so funny to watch these girls. They go, oh, oh, that really hurt. I'm like, because you, because you, because you bent your wrist. You can't, you can't do that. You gotta have a, you gotta have a solid punch. You can't be doing that crap. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so glad you're here, Gretchen, to say this because you know people who haven't done martial arts or boxing just don't get it. They actually think these self-defense te techniques work. And one time I went to one of these classes. And the guy was talking about how you, when a guy grabs you by, you know, grabs you like this, how you can twist out of it. So I went home to my mechanic husband, you know, and he, he you know, this guy, this guy's got arm, hands of steel, right? Uh, and I went, okay, honey, grab my hand. And he grabbed my wrist. And I'm like, let go of my wrist. I, I couldn't, there's no way in God's earth I could twist my hand out of anything. I thought he was going to break my damn arm. I went, I'm like, oh. <laughs> okay, that one doesn't work. <laughs> oh my God. Ah, just crazy stuff. <laughs> I'm with you, Dor Gretchen, no chance. Um, most parents would shield their child if someone tried to harm them. You think, but hanging onto his leg, oh, please stay here. Please stay here, bad guy. <laughs> Sometimes I just, I, you know, I, I just, I can't wrap my head around certain things. And they're like, like nobody's saying anything. I'm like, you're hanging onto a bad guy's leg and he wants to get away. The dude wants to run away and you want to keep him there. And of course, mind you, if he'd killed your son, if you knew he'd killed your son, you might want to keep him there so you could like, so he would be arrested and convicted of hurting her son. But at that point, she hasn't even a clue that he's even done anything to her son. So rather than make sure her son is safe, she's going to, you know, hang on to this guy. So, you know, so maybe he can beat her up and then go back and kill her son. I mean, so strange. So strange. Absolutely. Anyway. All right. So if that was, I say, it was a really tricky thing to do in the sense that, it's hard to go through all of that information. And, and a lot of times um, when I'm trying to present some, one of these cases, um, I want to put it into one show. So again, I don't like doing these drawing out things. I know some people say, oh, well, why don't you do that? You could do, you could do some four parts. You could do, you know, months worth of this stuff. But, you know, my point is to point out the, the real major issues, not to, not to sit there and just, you know, put in little pieces at a time and then draw it out forever and ever and ever so I can make money off of you guys. Um, it's to show what is very clear to me within a very short period of time. Um, and it's not a short period of time as far as I, I did read Diane Fanning's book. I, I, I did massive research on the net as much as I could find anything. And, you know, one of you could come up tomorrow and go, well, Pat, you missed this. And I'm like, son of a God, I never saw it. Um, because it's hard to find and things are very hard to find. Um, and it's true, some people are very good researchers and you know, they'll spend hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and they will come up with stuff I don't. But you know, I have I do try to have a life somewhere. <laughs> you know. And I can only be, to be able to present the, the YouTube shows, I can only spend a, a reasonable amount of time, which is still dozens of hours, doing certain shows. Um and I want this to be presentable in a period of time where I can point out the major issues and yeah, that's the whole point. I want to point out the major issues, and but this case was tricky, uh, tricky to understand. So I, I get it more. Um, you know, if you're Joe, you like <laughs> get tired of it. Like, oh my God, my brain is hurting. Yeah, you might have to go back. It's it is a comedy. Well, thank you very much, Joe. That's very nice of you. Um, was there any evidence of an intruder, or just Julie's words? No, there was never any evidence of an intruder. None. No. It's just Julie saying the intruder was there. Exactly. Um, so, you know, um, yeah. And that they, they, the prosecutor still believes she did it. He's, he's adamant she did it. The, the husband's adamant she did it. Um, but the Innocence Project is a big beast. And, and they have one hell of a team. And all they needed to do was eventually get a jury that, by the way, that by the time the jury got in there, I said they heard they heard so much stuff, and um, there was such a strong, um, such a strong, what do you want to call it, support of Julie at that point. You feel like a dog going against her, you know, uh, and thinking that she still could have done it. I mean, when I when I've looked at everybody's viewpoint on this case, I'm telling you, 
I'm not coming out good on this one. I mean, this is a case where if only I could absolutely believe Tommy Sells did it and totally believe her story, I'd be in a lot better shape as a profiler. This is one of these cases a lot of people won't even touch if they don't believe she's 100% innocent. They won't touch it because it, it, it's no, I'm going to get hate. I'm going to get a lot of hate out of this. I'm going to get a tremendous amount of hate. Um, and again, I'm not saying she's guilty. I'm just saying I don't think there's proof that she's innocent. And I have issues with her story that just don't add up. And there's zero proof that he did it, in my opinion. So, but I'm sure the hate mail will come. <laughs> because it's not a popular stance, shall we say that? Not popular. Um, Christine says, uh, in response, the Lawrence County State's Attorney of Office says it will allow a strand of hair found in the boy's hand to be tested for DNA. Really? Okay. And what happened with that? It's 2003. This is 2022. Um, you, by the way, usually when you find hair in somebody's hand, you know whose hair it is? It's their own. It's usually their own because their hair is here and they're, they're, they're like trying to block whatever's happening and their hands go like this. And they, almost majority of the time, the hair in their hand is actually their own, which is always really disappointing when you're trying to prove who did it. So, that way. and you know, yeah, and that went nowhere. So, you know, fascinating uh but a really really interesting case and i'm glad i looked at it um i try to think oh oh i want to just point out one thing okay i have to find i have to find this comment that was made to me by i thought it was great um and this is from t coon t-e-e-k-o-o-n um and she said or he said um that, that watching the um, the uh, the show the um, the uh, hangout show I was doing the thing about the speckled ban and and, and um, Sherlock Holmes and it was a little, kind of the story was kind of unbelievable and I don't know how Sherlock Holmes even came to that weird conclusion but anyway when I was watching it one of the things I appreciated that he said during the show was he initially went off in the wrong direction because there was a band of gypsies in the area and the girl when she was dying said, speckled band and he thought maybe it meant the gypsies and because of that he actually focused on the gypsies originally and he said you know i you know i was distracted by that and went the wrong direction and i wanted that people to understand that profiling is not about absoluteness like oh this i profiled it and this means this is what happened profiling is a, is a way to encourage an investigative avenue and depending on sometimes you can screw up but also what tikkun said was Another quote came from uh, Arthur Conan Doyle. I had come to an entirely erroneous conclusion, which shows, my dear Watson, how dangerous it always is to reason from insufficient data. And so what the media is putting out is not, is not only insufficient data, but incorrect data, and also pushing data that is not necessarily accurate or even even um, something that you should be considering. So when you have agendas behind it, Innocence, Innocence Project is a huge agenda. When you have that, you get data that is not uh, necessarily accurate or believable, or, but people believe it. That's the problem. So when they get that, they then make wrong conclusions. So even Sherlock Holmes can make wrong conclusions off of data that's crap. And so that's why I'm trying to po promote pose to you that a lot of the media stuff is that kind of stuff and so you start believing it you read diane fanning's book and you will believe he committed three crimes that he has not been proven to have committed because she put his name into the stories um and there's no proof that he committed those crimes so why is his name in the stories um and then you hear that he said these things and we don't know that he said these things we don't know if he has fed information we don't know a lot of these things are true and we're also being certain information is being left out so we don't consider it and so the media is very clever like 2020 on what they'll present and what they won't present and they're also clever they're going to present oh look they looked at her as guilty and then we're going to prove that she's not so they have their agenda and and you think oh my god i'm learning so much from the show i you know oh now i know she's innocent do you or are you just following they're manipulating your mind and you're coming to erroneous conclusions based on that whether you think she's guilty or not is not the issue. It's it's that we can draw erroneous conclusions from the media who is manipulating our minds. Um, 
Dr. Grande said the same about Darley, Darley Root, Routier. I'm not sure what he said the same about. What is that? Um, I mean, I did a show on Darley Routier where, where I think Dr. Grande and I, I think he thinks she's guilty. Uh, I'm pretty sure, I mean, the evidence is heavy that she is guilty and is where she belongs. So, um, oh, that's interesting. The hair in Colette McDonald's hand was her own as well. Yeah, see that? That's very interesting. And it's just also often very, very true. Um, I'm not sure. Oh, I got to go back here now because I'm, I'm sure that's part of it. Uh... I saw part of that, Benny. That's why I was leaning, leaning toward innocence. What was Benny looking at? I'm trying to figure out what you were saying, Benny. I can't, I'm trying to go backwards, and I can't quite figure it out. Um, Dr. Grande isn't a criminal profile, though. He's good on some psychological topics where he has deep knowledge. Yes, I agree with that. I, I do, I do uh, uh, sometimes uh, recommend Dr. Grande's channel because I think he does have a really good way of presenting psychological issues. I think occasionally he's not quite correct on criminal crime scene analysis <laughs> so put it that way but I still do recommend his channel because I think he has a lot to you know it's very interesting so it's okay um yeah I, th I think that's probably it personality disorders and psychology crime isn't his best work eh, probably but you know crime makes more money than psychology <laughs> it's true and sad but um yeah so but I still do recommend him the, I know people some oh he was wrong on that well no don't dump somebody because they're wrong on, because well, you think they're wrong on a case. It's not a reason to, you know, then determine that they're not worth anything. Um, because you could think I'm wrong on a case, and I hope that when you disagree with me on something, you don't say, oh, look, she's a completely worthless uh, educator. She's a completely worthless profile because, my God, she's wrong on that. <laughs> you know, it's like one shot and you're out, you know. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> See, see, under a lot of pressure here on YouTube. So anyway, um, so that's it for today. I hope you did learn something about. I say it was a very, it's a very difficult case to present in the way I wanted to present it. But I hope you did understand what I was getting at. And um, you know, I think it was um, very, very fascinating to me because thank you, Benny. And I know now, now Benny still likes me because he didn't think he 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 thought she's uh, not so innocent. And you know. <laughs> you probably had no idea where I was going with this one. So it's like, wow, Pat Brown? I can't believe she thought, you know, it's totally innocent. Mm. No, but anyway, <laughs> so anyway, I will see some of you. Um, what week are we on? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is, um, I'm leaving tomorrow morning for Knoxville, Tennessee, where I'm working on a television show doing a thing on serial killer. Um, and I won't tell you which serial killer it is because I'm keeping that on the down low. Um, and then I'll be back on Tuesday night in time for Wednesday is going to be the hangout. And then Friday is the Asia. I haven't figured out the crime for Asia yet. Asia, Oceania, you know, Australia, New Zealand, anybody that direction. Um, and then, of course, the Sunday show, which I also haven't figured out yet. So, but um, hopefully I'll see you guys there. So, and if you haven't liked and subscribed to the show, just do that for God's sakes. You know, help me out here. <laughs> I'll see you guys later.